Act One of Pillars of Society by Henrik Ibsen, translated by R. Farquharson Sharp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Karsten Burnick, read by Bruce Peary. Mrs. Burnick, read by Beth Thomas. Olaf, read by Tricia G. Martha Burnick, read by Dorothy Godfrey Smith. Johann Tunnison, read by M. B. Lona Hessel, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Hilmar Tunnison, read by Algie Pug. Dina Dorf, read by Christine G. Roland, read by Todd. Mr. Rummel, read by Larry Wilson. Fiegeland, read by Brad Philippone. Sandstead, read by David Olson. Cop, read by Rob Board. Owner, read by Alan Mapstone. Mrs. Rommel, read by Kathy Wright. Mrs. Holt, read by Abai. Mrs. Linger, read by Lydia. Narrator, read by April Walters. Act One. The action takes place at the Burnick's house in one of the smaller coast towns in Norway. Scene. A spacious garden room in the Burnick's house. In the foreground on the left is a door leading to Burnick's business room. Farther back in the same wall, a similar door. In the middle of the opposite wall, there is a large entrance door which leads to the street. The wall in the background is almost wholly composed of plate glass. A door in it opens upon a broad flight of steps which lead down to the garden. A sun awning is stretched over the steps. Below the steps, a part of the garden is visible, bordered by a fence with a small gate in it. On the other side of the fence runs a street, the opposite side of which is occupied by small wooden houses painted in bright colors. It is summer, and the sun is shining warmly. People are seen every now and then, passing along the street and stopping to talk to one another, others going in and out of a shop at the corner, etc. In the room, a gathering of ladies is seated round a table. Mrs. Burnick is presiding. On her left are Mrs. Holt and her daughter Netta, and next to them Mrs. Rummel and Hilda Rummel. On Mrs. Burnick's right are Mrs. Linga, Martha Burnick, and Dina Dorf. All the ladies are busy working. On the table lie great piles of linen garments and other articles of clothing, some half finished and some merely cut out. Farther back, at a small table on which two pots of flowers and a glass of sugared water are standing, Rorland is sitting, reading aloud from a book with gilt edges, but only loud enough for the spectators to catch a word now and then. Out in the garden, Olaf Burnick is running about and shooting at a target with a toy crossbow. After a moment, One comes in quietly through the door on the right. There's a slight interruption in the reading. Mrs. Burnick nods to him and points to the door on the left. One goes quietly across, knocks softly at the door of Burnick's room, and, after a moment's pause, knocks again. Crop comes out of the room with his hat in his hand and some papers under his arm. Oh, it was you knocking. Mr. Burnick sent for me. He did, but he cannot see you. He has deputed me to tell you. Deputed you? All the same. I would much rather... Deputed me to tell you what he wanted to say to you. You must give up these Saturday lectures of yours to the men. Indeed. I supposed I might use my own time. You must not use your own time in making the men useless in working hours. Last Saturday you were talking to them of the harm that would be done to the workmen by our new machines and the new working methods at the yard. What makes you do that? I do it for the good of the community. That's curious, because Mr. Burnick says it's disorganising the community. My community is not Mr. Burnick's, Mr. Crop. As president of the Industrial Association, I must... You are, first and foremost, president of Mr. Burnick's shipbuilding yard. And, before everything else, you have to do your duty to the community known as the firm of Burnick and Company. That is what every one of us lives for. Well, now you know what Mr. Burnick had to say to you. 
Mr. Bernick would not have put it that way, Mr. Crop, but I know well enough whom I have to thank for this. It is that damned American boat. Those fellows expect to get work done here the way they are accustomed to it over there, and that— Yes, yes, but I can't go into all these details. You know now what Mr. Burnick means, and that is sufficient. Be as good as to go back to the yard. Probably you are needed there. I shall be down myself in a little while. Excuse me, ladies. Crop bows to the ladies and goes out through the garden and down the street. One goes quietly out to the right. Rorland, who has continued his reading during this foregoing conversation, which has been carried on in low tones, has now come to the end of his book and shuts it with a bang. There, my dear ladies, that is the end of it. Hmm, what an instructive tale. And such a good moral. A book like that really gives one something to think about. Quite so. It presents a salutary contrast to what, unfortunately, meets our eyes every day in the newspapers and magazines. Look at the gilded and painted exterior displayed by any large community, and think what it really conceals. Emptiness and rottenness, if I may say so. No foundation of morality beneath it. In a word, these large communities of ours nowadays are whited sepulchres. How true, how true. And for an example of it, we need look no farther than at the crew of the American ship that is lying here just now. Oh, I would rather not speak of such off-scorings of humanity as that. But even in higher circles, what is the case there? A spirit of doubt and unrest on all sides? Minds never at peace? An instability characterizing all their behavior? Look how completely family life is undermined over there. Look at their shameless love of casting doubt on even the most serious truths. Dina, without looking up from her work. But are there not many big things done there, too? Big things done? I do not understand. Good gracious, Dina! Dina, how can you? I think it would scarcely be a good thing for us if such big things became the rule here. No, indeed. We ought to be only too thankful that things are as they are in this country. It is true enough that tares grow up amongst our wheat here, too, alas, but we do our best conscientiously to weed them out as well as we are able. The important thing is to keep society pure, ladies, to ward off all the hazardous experiments that a restless age seeks to force upon us. And there are more enough of them in the wind, unhappily. Yes. You know last year we only, by a hair's breath, escaped the project of having a railway here. Ah, my husband prevented that. Providence, Mrs. Burnick. You may be certain that your husband was the instrument of a higher power when he refused to have anything to do with the scheme. And yet they said such horrible things about him in the newspapers. But we have quite forgotten to thank you, Mr. Rowland. It is really more than friendly of you to sacrifice so much of your time to us. Not at all. This is holiday time, and— Yes, but it is a sacrifice all the same, Mr. Rowland. Rowland, drawing his chair nearer. Don't speak of it, my dear lady. Are you not all of you making some sacrifice in a good cause? And that willingly and gladly? These poor fallen creatures for whose rescue we are working may be compared to soldiers wounded on the field of battle. You, ladies, are the kind-hearted sisters of mercy who prepare the lint for these stricken ones, lay the bandages softly on their wounds, heal them, and cure them. It must be a wonderful gift to be able to see everything in such a beautiful light. A good deal of it is inborn in one, but it can be, to a great extent, acquired too. All that is needful is to see things in the light of a serious mission in life. To Martha. What do you say, Miss Burnick? Have you not felt as if you were standing on firmer grounds that you gave yourself up to your schoolwork? I really do not know what to say. There are times, when I am in the schoolroom down there, that I wish I were far away out on the stormy seas. That is mere temptation, dear Miss Burnick. You ought to shut the doors of your mind upon such disturbing guests as that. By the stormy seas, for of course you do not intend me to take your word literally, 
you mean the restless tide of the great outer world where so many are shipwrecked do you really set such store on the life you hear rushing by outside only look out into the street there they go walking about in the heat of the sun perspiring and tumbling about over their little affairs no we undoubtedly have the best of it who are able to sit here in the cool and turn our backs on the quarter from which disturbance comes yes i have no doubt you are perfectly right and in a house like this in a good and pure home where family life shows in its fairest colors where peace and harmony rule to mrs burnick what are you listening to mrs burnick mrs burnick who has turned toward the door of burnick's room they are talking very loud in there is there anything particular going on i don't know i can hear that there is somebody with my husband hilmar tunnison smoking a cigar appears in the doorway on the right but stops short at the sight of the company of ladies oh excuse me hilmar turns to go back no hilmar come along in you are not disturbing us do you want something no i only wanted to look in here good morning ladies to mrs burnick well what is the result of what carston has summoned a meeting you know has he what about oh it is this railway nonsense over again is it possible poor carston is he to have more annoyance over that but how do you explain that mr tonneson you know that last year mr burnick made it perfectly clear that he would not have a railway here yes that is what i thought too but i met crop his confidential clerk and he told me that the railway project had been taken up again and that mr burnick was in consultation with three of our local capitalists uh, i was right in thinking i heard my husband's voice of course mr rummel is in it and so are stonstadt and michael vigelond saint michael as they call him ahem i beg your pardon mr Rowland. just when everything was so nice and peaceful well as far as i am concerned i have not the slightest objection to their beginning their squabbling again it will be a little diversion anyway i think we can dispense with that sort of diversion it depends how you are constituted certain natures feel the lust of battle now and then but unfortunately life in a country town does not offer much in that way and it isn't given to every one hilmar turns the leaves of the book rorland has been reading woman is the handmaid of society what sort of drivel is this my dear hilmar you must not say that you certainly have not read the book no and i have no intention of reading it either surely you are not feeling quite well today no i am not perhaps you did not sleep well last night no i slept very badly i went for a walk yesterday evening for my health's sake and i finished up at the club and read a book about a polar expedition there is something bracing in following the adventures of men who are battling with the elements but it does not appear to have done you much good mr tonneson no it certainly did not i lay all night tossing about only half asleep and dreamt that i was being chased by a hideous walrus olaf who meanwhile has come up the steps from the garden have you been chased by a walrus uncle i dreamt it you duffer do you mean to say you were still playing about with that ridiculous bow why don't you get hold of a real gun i should like to but there is some sense in a thing like that there's always an excitement every time you fire it off and then i could shoot bears uncle but daddy won't let me you really mustn't put such ideas into his head hilma hmm it's a nice breed we are educating up nowadays isn't it we talk a great deal about manly sports goodness knows but we only play with the question all the same there is never any serious inclination for the bracing discipline that lies in facing danger manfully don't stand pointing your crossbow at me blockhead it might go off no uncle there's no arrow in it you don't know that there isn't they may be all the same take it away i tell you 
why on earth have you never gone over to america on one of your father's ships you might have seen a buffalo hunt then or a fight with red indians oh hilma i should like that awfully uncle and then perhaps i might meet uncle johann and aunt lona Humph. rubbish you can go down into the garden again now olaf mother may i go out into the street too yes but not too far mind olaf runs down into the garden and out through the gate in the fence you ought not to put such fancies into the child's head mr tonneson no of course he is destined to be a miserable stay-at-home like so many others but why do you not take a trip over there yourself i with my wretched health of course i get no consideration on that account but putting that out of the question you forget that one has certain obligations to perform towards the community of which one forms a part there must be some one here to hold aloft the banner of the ideal Ugh, there he is shouting again who is shouting, who is shouting? i am sure i don't know they are raising their voices so loud in there that it gets on my nerves i expect it is my husband mr tonson but you must remember he is so accustomed to addressing large audiences i should not call the others low-voiced either good lord no not on any question that touches their pockets everything here ends in these petty material considerations oh anyway that is a better state of things than it used to be when everything ended in mere frivolity things really used to be as bad as that here indeed they were mrs linger you may think yourself lucky that you did not live here then yes times have changed and no mistake when i look back to the days when i was a girl no oh, you need not look back more than fourteen or fifteen years god forgive us what a life we led there used to be a dancing society and a musical society and the dramatic club i remember it very well yes that was where your play was performed mr tunnison hilmar from the back of the room what what a play by mr tunnison yes it was long before you came here mr worland and it was only performed once was that not the play in which you told me you took the part of a young man's sweetheart mrs rummel mrs rummel glancing towards Rorland, i i really cannot remember mrs linga but i remember well all the riotous gaiety that used to go on yes there were houses i could name in which two large dinner parties were given in one week and surely i have heard that a touring theatrical company came here too yes that was the worst thing of the lot <clears throat> did you say a theatrical company no i don't remember that at all oh yes and i have been told they played all sorts of mad pranks what is really the truth of those stories there is practically no truth in them mrs linga dina my dina, love dear, will you give will me you go that and ask katrine to bring us our coffee i will go with you dina dina and martha go out by the farther door on the left mrs Burnick getting up will you excuse me for a few minutes i think we'll have our coffee outside she goes out to the veranda and sets to work to lay a table Rorland stands in the doorway talking to her hilmar sits outside smoking my goodness mrs linga how you frightened me i yes but you know it was you that began it mrs rummel i how can you say such a thing mrs holt not a syllable passed my lips but what does it all mean what made you begin to talk about think did you not see that dina was in the room dina good gracious is there anything wrong with and in this house too did you not know it was mrs Burnick's brother what about him i know nothing about it at all i am quite new to the place you know have you not heard that <coughs> to her daughter hilda dear can you go for a little stroll in the garden you go too netta and be very kind to put dina when she comes back hilda and netta go out into the garden well what about mr Burnick's brother don't you know the dreadful scandal about him a dreadful scandal about mr tonneson good heavens no mr tonneson is her cousin of course mrs linga 
i am speaking of her brother the wicked mr tonnison his name was johann he ran away to america had to run away you must understand then it is he the scandal is about yes there was something how shall i put it there was something of some kind between him and Dina's mother. I remember it all as if it were yesterday. Johann Tunnison was in old Mrs. Burnick's office then. Karsten Burnick had just come back from Paris. He had not yet become engaged. Yes, but what was the scandal? Well, you must know that Moeller's company were acting in the town that winter and dorf the actor and his wife were in the company all the young men in the town were infatuated with her yes goodness knows how they could think her pretty well dorf came home late one evening quite unexpectedly and found his no really it isn't a thing one can talk about after all, Mrs. Rummel, he didn't find anything, because the door was locked on the inside. Yes, that is just what I was going to say. He found the door locked. And, just think of it, the man that was in the house had to jump out of the window. Right down from an attic window. And that was Mrs. Burnick's brother. Yes, it was he. And that was why he ran away to America? Yes, he had to run away, you may be sure. Because something was discovered afterwards that was nearly as bad. Just think. He had been making free with the cash box. But, you know, no one was certain of that, Mrs. Rummel. Perhaps there was no truth in the rumor. Well, I must say, wasn't it known all over town? Did not old Mrs. Burnick nearly go bankrupt as a result of it? However, God forbid I should be the one to spread such reports. Well, anyway, Mrs. Dorf didn't get the money because she... Yes, what happened to Dina's parents afterwards? Well, Dorf deserted both his wife and his child. But Madame was impudent enough to stay here a whole year. Of course, she had not the face to appear at the theatre any more, but she kept herself by taking in washing and sewing. And then she tried to set up a dancing school. Naturally, that was no good. What parents would trust their children to such a woman? But it did not last very long. The fine madam was not accustomed to work. She got something wrong with her lungs and died of it. What a horrible scandal! yes you can imagine how hard it was upon the burnicks it is the dark spot among the sunshine of their good fortune as rummel once put it so never speak about it in this house mrs linga and for heaven's sake never mention the stepsister either oh so mrs burnick has a stepsister too had luckily for the relationship between them is all over now she was an extraordinary person too would you believe it she cut her hair short and used to go about in men's boots in bad weather and when her stepbrother the black sheep had gone away and the whole town naturally was talking about him what do you think she did she went out to america to him yes but remember the scandal she caused before she went to mrs holt hush don't speak of it my goodness did she create a scandal too i think you ought to hear it mrs linga mr burnick had just got engaged to betty tunnison and the two of them went arm in arm into her aunt's room to tell her the news the tunnison's parents were dead you know when suddenly up got lona hessel from her chair and gave our refined and well-bred karsten burnick such a box on the ear that his head swam well i am sure i never it is absolutely true and then she packed her box and went away to america i suppose she had her eye on him for herself of course she had 
she imagined that he and she would make a match of it when he came back from paris the idea of her thinking such a thing karsten burnick a man of the world and the pink of courtesy a perfect gentleman the darling of all the ladies and with it all such an excellent young man mrs holt so moral but what has this miss hessel made of herself in america well you see over that as my husband once put it has been drawn a veil which one should hesitate to lift what do you mean she no longer has any connection with the family as you may suppose but this much the whole town knows that she has sung for money in drinking saloons over there and has given lectures in public and has published some mad kind of book you don't say so yes it is true enough that lona hessel is one of the spots on the son of the burnick family's good fortune well now you know the whole story mrs Linga. i am sure i would never have spoken about it except to put you on your guard oh you may be sure i shall be most careful but that poor child dina dorf i am truly sorry for her well really it was a stroke of good luck for her think what it would have meant if she had been brought up by such parents of course we did our very best for her every one of us and gave her all the good advice we could eventually mrs burnett got her taken into this house but she has always been a difficult child to deal with it is only natural with all the bad examples she had had before her a girl of that sort is not like one of our own one must be lenient with her hush here she comes yes dina is really a clever girl oh is that you dina we are just putting away the things how delicious your coffee smells my dear dina a nice cup of coffee like that mrs burnick calling in from the veranda will you come out here meanwhile martha and dina have helped the maid to bring out the coffee all the ladies seat themselves on the veranda and talk with a great show of kindness to dina in a few moments dina comes back into the room and looks for her sewing mrs burnick from the coffee table dina won't you no thank you dina sits down to her sewing mrs burnick and Rowland exchange a few words a moment afterward he comes back into the room makes a pretext for going up to the table and begins speaking to dina in low tones dina yes why don't you want to sit with the others when i came in with the coffee i could see from the strange lady's face that they had been talking about me but did you not see as well how agreeable she was to you out there that is just what i will not stand you are very self-willed dina yes but why because it is my nature could you not try to alter your nature no why not dina looking at Rorland. because i am one of the poor fallen creatures you know for shame dina so was my mother who has spoken to you about such things no one they never do why don't they they all handle me in such a gingerly fashion as if they thought i should go to pieces if they oh how i hate all this kind-heartedness my dear dina i can quite understand that you feel repressed here but yes if only i could get right away from here i could make my own way quite well if only i did not live amongst people who are so 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 what so proper and so moral oh but dina you don't mean that you know quite well in what sense i mean it hilda and netta come here every day to be exhibited to me as good examples i can never be so beautiful behaved as they i don't want to be if only i were right away from it all i should grow to be worth something but you are worth a great deal dina dear what good does that do me here get right away you say do you mean it seriously i would not stay here a day longer if it were not for you tell me dina why is it that you are fond of being with me because you teach me so much that is beautiful beautiful do you call the little i can teach you beautiful yes 
or perhaps, to be accurate, it is not that you teach me anything, but when I listen to you talking, I see beautiful visions. What do you mean exactly when you call a thing beautiful? I have never thought it out. Think it out now, then. What do you understand by a beautiful thing? A beautiful thing is something that is great and far off. Hmm. Dina, I am so deeply concerned about you, my dear. Only that? You know perfectly well that you are dearer to me than I can say. If I were Hilda or Netta, you would not be afraid to let people see it. Ah, Dina. You can have no idea of the number of things I am forced to take into consideration. When it is a man's lot to be a moral pillar of the community he lives in, he cannot be too circumspect. If only I could be certain that people would interpret my motives properly. But no matter for that, you must, and shall be, helped to raise yourself. Dina, is it a bargain between us that when I come, when circumstances allow me to come, to you, and say, Here is my hand, you will take it and be my wife? Will you promise me that, Dina? Yes. Thank you, thank you, because for my part, too, Oh, Dina, I love you so dearly. Hush! Someone is coming. Dina, for my sake, go out to the others. Dina goes out to the coffee table. At the same moment, Rummel, Sandstad, and Vigeland come out of Bernick's room, followed by Bernick, who has a bundle of papers in his hand. Well, then the matter is settled. Yes, I hope to goodness it is. It is settled, Bernick. A Norseman's word stands as firm as the rocks on Doverfield, you know. And no one must falter, no one give way, no matter what opposition we meet with. We will stand or fall together, Bernick. Hilmar, coming in from the veranda. Fall? If I may ask, isn't it the railway scheme that is going to fall? No, on the contrary, it is going to proceed. Full steam, Mr. Tonneson. Hilmar, coming nearer. Really? How is that? Mrs. Burnick, at the veranda door. Carsten, dear, what is it that— My dear Betty, how can it interest you? To the three men. We must get out lists of subscribers, and the sooner the better. Obviously our four names must head the list. The positions we occupy in the community makes it our duty to make ourselves as prominent as possible in the affair. Obviously, Mr. Burnick. The thing shall go through, Burnick. I swear it shall. Oh, I have not the least anticipation of failure. We must see that we work, each one among the circle of his own acquaintances, and if we can point to the fact that the scheme is exciting a lively interest in all ranks of society, then it stands to reason that our municipal corporation will have to contribute its share. Carsten, you really must come out here and tell us. My dear Betty, it is an affair that does not concern ladies at all. Then you are really going to support this railway scheme, after all? Yes, naturally. But last year, Mr. Burnick. Last year it was quite another thing. At that time it was a question of a line along the coast. Which would have been quite superfluous, Mr. Rorland, because, of course, we have our steamboat service. And would have been quite unreasonably costly. Yes, and would have absolutely ruined certain important interests in the town. The main point was that it would not have been to the advantage of the community as a whole. That is why I opposed it, with the result that the inland line was resolved upon. Yes, but surely that will not touch the towns about here. It will eventually touch our town, my dear Hilmar, because we are going to build a branch line here. Aha! Uh -huh. A new scheme, then. Yes, isn't it a capital scheme? What? Hmm. There is no denying that it looks as though Providence had just planned the configuration of the country to suit a branch line. Do you really mean it, Mr. Vigeland? Yes, I must confess it seems to me as if it had been the hand of Providence that caused me to take a journey on business this spring, in the course of which I happened to traverse a valley through which I had never been before. It came across my mind like a flash of lightning that this was where we could carry a branch line down to our town. I got an engineer to survey the neighborhood, and have here the provisional calculations and estimate, so there is nothing to hinder us. Mrs. Burnick, who is still with the other ladies at the veranda door. But, my dear Carsten, to think that you should have kept it all a secret from us. 
ah my dear betty i knew you would not have been able to grasp the exact situation besides i have not mentioned it to a living soul until to-day but now the decisive moment has come and we must work openly and with all our might yes even if i have to risk all i have for its sake i mean to push the matter through and we will back you up bernick you may rely upon that do you really promise us so much then from this undertaking gentlemen yes undoubtedly think what a lever it will be to raise the status of our whole community just think of the immense tracts of forest land that it will make accessible think of all the rich deposits of minerals we shall be able to work think of the river with one waterfall above another think of the possibilities that open out in the way of manufactories and are you not afraid that an easier intercourse with the depravity of the outer world no you may make your mind quite easy on that score mr orland our little hive of industry rests nowadays god be thanked on such a sound moral basis we have all of us helped to drain it if i may use the expression and that we will continue to do each in his degree you mr Rorland, will continue your richly blessed activity in our schools and our homes we the practical men of business will be the support of the community by extending its welfare within as wide a radius as possible and our women yes come nearer ladies you will like to hear it our women i say our wives and daughters you ladies will work on undisturbed in the service of charity and moreover will be a help and a comfort to your nearest and dearest as my dear betty and martha are to me and olaf bernick looks around him where is olaf to-day oh uh, in the holidays it is impossible to keep him at home i have no doubt he is down at the shore again you will see he will end by coming to some harm there bah a little sport with the forces of nature your family affection is beautiful mr bernick well the family is the kernel of society a good home honored and trusty friends a little snug family circle where no disturbing elements can cast their shadow crop comes in from the right bringing letters and papers the foreign mail mr bernick and a telegram from new york bernick taking the telegram ah from the owners of the indian girl is the mail in oh then you must excuse me and me too good day mr bernick good day good day gentlemen and remember we have a meeting this afternoon at five o'clock yes yes quite, quite so, so of, of course. course the three men go out to the right bernick who has read the telegram this is thoroughly american absolutely shocking good gracious carsten what is it look at this crop read it do the least repairs possible send over indian girl as soon as she is ready to sail good time of year at a pinch her cargo will keep her afloat well i must say you see the state of things in these vaunted great communities you are quite right not a moment's consideration for human life when it is a question of making a profit to crop can the indian girl go to sea in four or five days yes if mr vigeland will agree to our stopping work on the palm tree meanwhile hmm, he won't well be so good as to look through the letters and look here did you see olaf down at the quay no mr bernick crop goes into bernick's room bernick looking at the telegram again these gentlemen think nothing of risking eight men's lives well it is the sailors calling to brave the elements it must be a fine tonic to the nerves to be like that with only a thin plank between one and the abyss i should like to see the shipowner amongst us who would condescend to such a thing there is not one that would do it not a single one bernick sees olaf coming up to the house ah thank heaven here he is safe and sound olaf with a fishing line in his hand comes running up the garden and in through the veranda uncle hilmer i have been down and seen the steamer have you been down to the quay again no i have only been out in a boat but just think uncle hilmer a whole circus company has come on shore with horses and animals and there were such lots of passengers no are we really to have a circus we i certainly have no desire to see it no 
of course i don't mean we but i should like to see a circus very much so should i you are a duffer is that anything to see mere tricks no it would be something quite different to see the gaucho careering over the pampas on his snorty mustang but heaven help us in these wretched little towns of ours olaf pulling at martha's dress look aunt martha look here they come good lord yes here they come Ugh, what horrid people a number of passengers and a whole crowd of townsfolk are seen coming up the street they are a set of mountbacks certainly just look at that woman in the gray dress mrs holt the one with the knapsack over her shoulder yes look she has slung it on the handle of her parasol the manager's wife i expect and there is the manager himself no doubt he looks like a regular pirate don't look at him hilda nor you netta mother the manager is bowing to us what what are you saying child yes and good heavens the woman is bowing to us that is a little too cool ah huh? what is it martha nothing nothing i thought for a moment look look there are the rest of them with the horses and animals and there are the americans too all the sailors from the indian girl the strains of yankee doodle played on a clarinet and a drum are heard hilmar stopping his ears oh, oh, oh. i think we ought to withdraw ourselves from sight a little ladies we have nothing to do with such goings-on let us go to our work again do you think we had better draw the curtains yes that was exactly what i meant the ladies resume their places at the work table rorland shuts the veranda door and draws the curtains over it and over the windows so the room becomes half dark olaf peeping out through the curtains mother the manager's wife is standing by the fountain now washing her face what in the middle of the marketplace and in broad daylight too well i must say that if i were travelling across a desert waste and found myself beside a well i am sure i should not stop to think whether oh that frightful clarinet it is really high time the police interfered oh no we must not be too hard on foreigners of course these folk have none of the deep-seated instincts of decency which restrain us within proper bounds suppose they do behave outrageously what does it concern us fortunately this spirit of disorder that flies in the face of all that is customary and right is absolutely a stranger to our community if i may say so what is this lona hessel walks briskly in from the door on the right the circus woman the manager's wife heavens what does this mean martha jumping up <gasps> how do you do betty dear how do you do martha how do you do brother-in-law lona as sure as i am alive mercy on us it cannot possibly be well ugh. lona is it really really me yes indeed it is you may fall on my neck if you like ugh. Ugh. and coming back here as and actually mean to appear in appear appear in what well i mean in the circus <laughs> are you mad brother-in-law do you think i belong to the circus troupe no certainly i have turned my hand to a good many things and made a fool of myself in a good many ways hmm. but i have never tried circus riding then you are not thank heaven no we traveled like other respectable folk second class certainly but we are accustomed to that we did you say whom do you mean by we i and the child of course the child the child what i really must say but what do you mean lona i mean john of course i have no other child as far as i know but john or johan as you used to call him johan mrs rummel in an undertone to mrs linga the scapegrace brother 
is johann with you of course he is i certainly would not come without him why do you look so tragical and why are you sitting here in the gloom sewing white things there has not been a death in the family has there madam you find yourself in the society for fallen women what can these nice quiet-looking ladies possibly be well really oh i understand but bless my soul that is surely mrs rummel and mrs holt sitting there too well we three have not grown younger since the last time we met but listen now good people let the fallen women wait for a day they will be none the worse for that a joyful occasion like this a homecoming is not always a joyful occasion indeed how do you read your bible mr parson i am not a parson no oh, you will grow into one then but fah this moral linen of yours smells tainted just like a winding sheet i am accustomed to the air of the prairies let me tell you burnick wiping his forehead yes it certainly is rather close in here wait a moment we will resurrect ourselves from this vault luna pulls the curtains to one side we must have broad daylight in here when the boy comes ah you will see a boy then that has washed himself Ugh. lona opening the veranda door and window i should say when he has washed himself up at the hotel for on the boat he got piggishly dirty Ugh. 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 why surely isn't that lona points at hildar and asks the others is he still loafing about here saying Ugh? i do not loaf it is the state of my health that keeps me here ahem <clears throat> ladies i do not think lona who has noticed olaf is he yours betty give me a paw my boy or are you afraid of your ugly old aunt rorland putting his book under his arm ladies i do not think any of us is in the mood for any more work today. i suppose we are to meet again tomorrow lona while the others are getting up and taking their leave yes let us i shall be on the spot you pardon me miss hessel but what do you propose to do in our society i will let some fresh air into it mr parson end of act one of society by henrik ibsen translated by r farquharson sharp this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org act two scene the same room mrs burnick is sitting alone at the work table sewing burnick comes in from the right wearing his hat and gloves and carrying a stick home already carsten yes i have made an appointment with a man oh yes i suppose johann is coming up here again with a man i said lays down his hat what has become of all the ladies to-day mrs rummel and hilda hadn't time to come oh did they send any excuse yes they had so much to do at home naturally and of course the others are not coming either no something has prevented them to-day too i could have told you that beforehand where is olaf i let him go out a little with dina hmm. she is a giddy little baggage did you see how she at once started making a fuss of johann yesterday but my dear carsten you know dina knows nothing whatever of no but in any case johann ought to have had sufficient tact not to pay her any attention i saw quite well from his face what vigeland thought of it mrs burnick laying her sewing down on her lap Carsten, can you imagine what his objective is in coming here well i know he has a farm over there and i fancy he is not doing particularly well with it she called attention yesterday to the fact that they were obliged to travel second class yes i am afraid it must be something of that sort but to think of her coming with him she after the deadly insult she offered you oh don't think about that ancient history how can i help thinking of it just now after all he is my brother still it is not on his account that i am distressed but because of all the unpleasantness it would mean for you carsten i am so dreadfully afraid afraid of what 
isn't it possible that they may send him to prison for stealing that money from your mother what rubbish who can prove that the money was stolen the whole town knows it unfortunately and you know you said yourself i said nothing the town knows nothing whatever about the affair the whole thing was no more than idle rumour how magnanimous you are carsten do not let us have any more of these reminiscences please you don't know how you torture me by raking all that up walks up and down then flings his stick away from him and to think of their coming home now just now when it is particularly necessary for me that i should stand well in every respect with the town and with the press our newspaper men will be sending paragraphs to the papers in the other towns about here whether i receive them well or whether i receive them ill it will all be discussed and talked over they will rake up all those old stories as you do in a community like ours Burnick throws his gloves down on the table and i have not a soul here to whom i can talk about it and to whom i can go for support no one at all carsten no who is there and to have them on my shoulders just at this moment without a doubt they will create a scandal in some way or another she in particular it is simply a calamity to be connected with such folk in any way well i can't help there what can't you help their being your relations no that's quite true and i did not ask them to come home that's it go on i did not ask them to come home i did not write to them i did not drag them home by the hair of their heads oh i know the whole rigmarole by heart <laughs> you need not be so unkind yes that's right begin to cry so that our neighbors may have that to gossip about too do stop being so foolish betty go and sit outside some one may come in here i don't suppose you want people to see the lady of the house with red eyes it would be a nice thing wouldn't it if the story got out about that there i hear some one in the passage a knock is heard at the door come in mrs burnick takes her sewing and goes out down the garden steps one comes in from the right good morning mr burnick good morning well i suppose you can guess what i want you for mr crop told me yesterday that you were not pleased with i am displeased with the whole management of the yard amna the work does not get on as quickly as it ought the palm tree ought to have been under sale long ago mr vigeland comes here every day to complain about it he is a difficult man to have with one as part owner the palm tree can go to sea the day after tomorrow at last but what about the american ship the indian girl which has been laid up here for five weeks and the american ship i understood that before everything else we were to work our hardest to get your own ship ready i gave you no reason to think so you ought to have pushed on as fast as possible with the work on the american ship also but you have not her bottom is completely rotten mr Bernick the more we patch it the worse it gets that is not the reason crop has told me the whole truth you do not understand how to work the new machines i have provided or rather you will not try to work them mr Bernick, i am well on in the fifties and ever since i was a boy i have been accustomed to the old ways of working we cannot work that way nowadays you must not imagine Anna, that it is for the sake of making profit i do not need that fortunately but i owe consideration to the community i live in and to the business i am at the head of i must take the lead in progress or there would never be any i welcome progress too mr Bernick. yes for your own limited circle for the working class oh i know what a busy agitator you are you make speeches you stir people up but when some concrete instance of progress presents itself as now in the case of our machines you do not want to have anything to do with it you are afraid yes i really am afraid mr Bernick. i am afraid for the number of men who will have the bread taken out of their mouths by these machines you are very fond sir of talking about the consideration we owe to the community 
it seems to me however that the community has its duties too why should science and capital venture to introduce these new discoveries into labour before the community has had time to educate a generation up to using them you read and think too much anna it does you no good and that is what makes you dissatisfied with your lot it is not mr bernick but i cannot bear to see one good workman dismissed after another to starve because of these machines mm. when the art of printing was discovered many a quill driver was reduced to starvation would you have admired the art so greatly if you had been a quill driver in those days sir i did not send for you to argue with you i sent for you to tell you that the indian girl must be ready to put to sea the day after to-morrow but mr bernick the day after to-morrow do you hear at the same time as our own ship not an hour later i have good reasons for hurrying on the work have you seen to-day's paper well then you know the pranks these american sailors have been up to again the rascally pack are turning the whole town upside down not a night passes without some brawling in the taverns or the streets not to speak of other abominations yes they certainly are a bad lot and who is it that has to bear the blame for all this disorder it is i yes it is i who have to suffer for it these newspaper fellows are making all sorts of covert insinuations because we are devoting all our energies to the palm tree i whose task in life it is to influence my fellow citizens by the force of example have to endure this sort of thing cast in my face i'm not going to stand that i have no fancy for having my good name smirched in that way your name stands high enough to endure that and a great deal more sir not just now at this particular moment i have need of all the respect and good will my fellow citizens can give me i have a big undertaking on the stocks as you probably have heard but if it should happen that evil disposed persons succeeded in shaking the absolute confidence i enjoy it might land me in the greatest difficulties that is why i want at any price to avoid these shameful innuendos in the papers and that is why i name the day after to-morrow as the limit of the time i can give you mr bernick you might just as well name this afternoon as the limit you mean that i am asking an impossibility yes with the hands we have now at the yard very good then we must look about elsewhere do you really mean sir to discharge still more of your old workmen no i am not thinking of that because i think it would cause bad blood against you both among the townsfolk and in the papers if you did that very probably therefore we will not do it but if the indian girl is not ready to sail the day after to-morrow i shall discharge you me Huh. you are joking mr bernick i should not be so sure of that if i were you do you mean that you can contemplate discharging me me whose father and grandfather worked in your yard all their lives as i have done myself who is it that is forcing me to do it you are asking what is impossible mr bernick oh where there's a will there's a way yes or no give me a decisive answer or consider yourself discharged on the spot one coming a step nearer to him mr bernick have you ever realized what discharging an old workman means you think he can look about for another job oh yeah he can do that but does that dispose of the matter you should just be there once in the house of a workman who has been discharged the evening he comes home bringing all his tools with him do you think i am discharging you with a light heart have i not always been a good master to you so much the worse mr bernick just for that very reason those at home will not blame you they will say nothing to me because they dare not but they will look at me when i am not noticing and think that i must have deserved it you see sir that is 
that is what i cannot bear i am a mere nobody i know but i have always been accustomed to stand first in my own home my humble home is a little community too mr bernick a little community which i have been able to support and maintain because my wife has believed in me and because my children have believed in me and now it is all to fall to pieces still if there is nothing else for it the lesser must go down before the greater the individual must be sacrificed to the general welfare i can give you no other answer and that and no other is the way of the world you are an obstinate man alna you are opposing me not because you cannot do otherwise but because you will not exhibit the superiority of machinery over manual labour and you will not be moved mr Bernick, because you know that if you drive me away you will at all events have given the newspapers proof of your good will and suppose that were so i have told you what it means for me either bringing the press down on my back or making them well disposed to me at a moment when i am working for an objective which will mean the advancement of the general welfare well then can i do otherwise than as i am doing the question let me tell you turns upon this whether your home is to be supported as you put it or whether hundreds of new homes are to be prevented from existing hundreds of homes that will never be built never have a fire lighted on their hearth unless i succeed in carrying through the scheme i am working for now that is the reason why i have given you your choice well if that is the way things stand i have nothing more to say hmm my dear anna i am extremely grieved to think that we are to part we are not going to part mr Bernick. how is that even a common man like myself has something he is bound to maintain quite so quite so then i presume you think you may promise the indian girl shall be ready to sail the day after to-morrow one bows and goes out to the right ah i have got the better of that obstinate fellow i take it as a good omen hilmar comes in through the garden door smoking a cigar hilmar as he comes up the steps to the veranda good morning betty good morning carsten good morning ah i see you have been crying so i suppose you know all about it too know all about what that the scandal is in full swing Ugh. what do you mean hilmar coming into the room why that our two friends from america are displaying themselves about the streets in the company of dina dorf mrs Burnick coming in after him hilmar is it possible yes unfortunately it is quite true luna was so even wanting in tact as to call after me but of course i appeared not to have heard her and no doubt all this has not been unnoticed you may well say that people stood still and looked at them it spread like wildfire through the town just like a prairie fire out west in every house people were at the windows waiting for the procession to pass cheek by jowl behind the curtains Ugh. Uh, you must excuse me betty for saying Ugh. this has really got on my nerves if it is going on i shall be forced to think about getting right away from here but you should have spoken to him and represented to him that in the open street no <laughs> excuse me i could not do that to think that the fellow should dare to show himself in the town at all well we shall see if the press doesn't put a stopper on him yes forgive me betty but the press do you say have you heard a hint of anything of the sort there are such things fly about when i left here yesterday evening i looked in at the club because i did not feel well i saw at once from the sudden silence that fell when i went in that our american couple had been the subject of conversation then that impudent newspaper fellow hammer came in and congratulated me at the top of his voice on the return of my rich cousin rich those were his words naturally i looked him up and down in the manner he deserved 
and gave him to understand that I knew nothing about Johann Tornison's being rich. Really, he said, that is very remarkable. People usually get on in America when they have something to start with, and I believe your cousin did not go over there quite empty-handed. Hm. Now, will you oblige me by— There, you see, Carsten. Anyhow, I have spent a sleepless night because of them. And here he is, walking about the streets as if nothing were the matter. Why shouldn't he disappear for good and all? It really is insufferable how hard some people are to kill. My dear Hilma, what are you saying? Oh, nothing. But here this fellow escapes with a whole skin from railway accidents, and fights with California grizzlies and Blackfoot Indians, has not even been scalped. Ugh, here they come. Burnick, looking down the street. Olaf is with them, too. Of course. They want to remind everyone that they belong to the best family in the town. Look there. Look at that crowd of loafers that have come out of the chemists to stare at them and make remarks. My nerves were really standard how a man is to be expected to keep the banner of the ideal fly under such circumstances. I— They are coming here. Listen, Betty, it is my particular wish that you should receive them in the friendliest possible way. Oh, may I, Carsten? Certainly, certainly, and you too, Hilmar. It is to be hoped that they will not stay here very long, and when we are quite by ourselves, no allusions to the past, we must not hurt their feelings in any way. How magnanimous you are, Carsten. No, oh, don't speak of that. But you must let me thank you, and you must forgive me for being so hasty. I am sure you had every reason to— Don't talk about it, please. Ugh. Johann Tonneson and Dina come up through the garden, followed by Lona and Olaf. Good morning, dear people. We've been out having a look round the old place, Karsten. So I hear. Greatly altered, is it not? Mr. Burnick's great and good works everywhere. We've been up into the recreation ground you have presented to the town. Have you been there? The gift of Karsten Burnick, as it says over the gateway. You seem to be responsible for the whole place here. Splendid ships you've got, too. I met my old schoolfellow, the captain of the palm tree. And you have built a new schoolhouse, too. And I hear that the town has to thank you for both the gas supply and the water supply. Well, one ought to work for the good of the community one lives in. That is an excellent sentiment, brother-in-law, but it is a pleasure all the same to see how people appreciate you. I am not vain, I hope, but I could not resist reminding one or two of the people we talked to that we were relations of yours. Ugh. Do you say ugh to that? No, I said ahem. Oh, poor chap, you may say that if you like. But are you by yourselves today? Yes, we are by ourselves today. Ah, yes, we met a couple of members of your morality society up at the market. They made out they were very busy. You and I have never had an opportunity for a good talk yet. Yesterday you had your three pioneers here, as well as the parson. The schoolmaster. I call him the parson. But now tell me, what you think of my work during these fifteen years? Hasn't he grown a fine fellow? Who would recognize the madcap that ran away from home? <clears throat> now, Lona, don't brag too much about me. Well, I can tell you, I am precious proud of him. Goodness knows it is about the only thing I have done in my life, but it does give me a sort of right to exist. When I think, Johann, how we two began over there with nothing but our four bare fists. Hands. I say fists, and they were dirty fists. Ugh. And empty, too. Empty? Uh, well, uh, I must say. What must you say? Ahem. I must say. Ugh. Hilmar goes out through the garden. What is the matter with the man? Oh, do not take any notice of him. His nerves are rather upset just now. Would you not like to take a look at the garden? You have not been down there yet, and I have got an hour to spare. With pleasure. I can tell you my thoughts have been with you in this garden many and many a time. We have made a great many alterations there, too, as you will see. Burnick, Mrs. Burnick, and Lona go down to the garden, where they are visible every now and then during the following scene. Olaf, coming to the veranda door. Uncle Hilmer, do you know what Uncle Johann asked me? He asked me if I would go to America with him. 
you you duffer who are tied to your mother's apron strings ah but i won't be that any longer you will see when i grow big oh fiddlesticks you really have no serious bent towards the strength of character necessary to they go down to the garden dina meanwhile has taken off her hat and is standing at the door on the right shaking the dust off her dress the walk has made you pretty warm yes it was a splendid walk i have never had such a splendid walk before do you not often go for a walk in the morning oh yes but only with olaf i see would you rather go down into the garden and stay here no i would rather stay here so would i then uh, shall we consider it a bargain that we are to go for a walk like this together every morning no mr tonnison you mustn't do that what mustn't i do you promised you know yes but on second thought you mustn't go out with me but why not of course you are a stranger you cannot understand but i must tell you well no i would rather not talk about it oh but you must you can talk to me about whatever you like well i must tell you that i am not like the other young girls here there is something something or other about me that is why you mustn't but i don't understand anything about it you have not done anything wrong no not i but no i am not going to talk any more about it now you will hear about it from the others sure enough hmm. but there is something else i want very much to ask you what's that i suppose it is easy to make a position for oneself over in america no it's not always easy at, at first you have to rough it and work very hard i should be quite ready to do that you i can work now i am strong and healthy and aunt martha taught me a lot well hang it come back with us ah now you are only making fun of me you said that to olaf too but what i wanted to know is if people are so very so very moral over there moral yes i mean are they as as proper and well behaved as they are here well at all events they're not so bad as people here make out you need not be afraid on that score you don't understand me what i want to hear is just that they are not so proper and so moral not well what would you wish them to be then i would wish them to be natural well i believe that is just what they are because in that case i should get on if i went there oh you would for certain a and that is why you must come back with us no i don't want to go with you i must go alone oh i would make something of my life i would get on Burnick speaking to lona and his wife at the foot of the garden steps wait a moment i will fetch it betty dear you might so easily catch cold Burnick comes into the room and looks for his wife's shawl mrs Burnick from outside you must come out too johann we are going down to the grotto no i want johann to stay here look here dina you take my wife's shawl and go with them johann is going to stay here with me betty dear i want to hear how he's getting on over there very well then you will follow us you know where you will find us mrs Burnick, lona and nina go out through the garden to the left Burnick looks after them for a moment then goes to the farther door on the left and locks it after which he goes up to johann grasps both his hands and shakes them warmly johann now that we are alone you must let me thank you oh nonsense my home and all the happiness that it means to me my position here as a citizen all these i owe to you well i'm glad of it karsten some good came of that mad story after all then Burnick, grasping his hands again but still you must let me thank you not one in ten thousand would have done what you did for me rubbish weren't we both of us young and thoughtless uh, one of us had to take the blame you know but surely the guilty one was the proper one to do that stop at the moment the innocent one happened to be the proper one to do it remember i had no ties i was an orphan it was a lucky chance to get free from the drudgery of the office you on the other hand had your old mother still alive and besides that you had just become secretly engaged to betty who was devoted to you what would have happened between you and her if it had come to her ears that is true enough but still and wasn't it just for betty's sake that you broke off your acquaintance with mrs dorff why it was merely in order to put an end to the whole thing that you were up there with her that evening 
yes that unfortunate evening when that drunken creature came home yes johann it was for betty's sake but all the same it was splendid of you to let all the appearances go against you and to go away put your scruples to rest my dear karsten we agreed that it should be so you had to be saved and you were my friend i can tell you i was uncommonly proud of that friendship here was i drudging away like a miserable stick in the mud when you came back from your grand tour abroad a great swell who had been to london and to paris and you chose me for your chum although i was four years younger than you it is true it was because you were courting betty i understand that now but i was proud of it who would not have been who would not willingly have sacrificed himself for you especially as it only meant a month's talk in the town and enabled me to get away into the wide world ah my dear johann i must be candid and tell you that the story is not so completely forgotten yet isn't it well what does that matter to me once i'm back over there on my farm again then you mean to go back of course but not immediately i hope as soon as possible it was only to humor lona that i came over with her you know really how so well you see lona is no longer young and lately she began to be obsessed with homesickness but she would never admit it how could she venture to risk leaving such a flighty fellow as me alone who before i was nineteen had been mixed up in <laughs> well what then well karsten now i am coming to a confession that i am ashamed to make you surely haven't confided the truth to her yes it was very wrong of me but i could not do otherwise you can have no conception what lona has been to me you never could put up with her but she has been like a mother to me the first year we were out there when things went so badly with us you have no idea how she worked and when i was ill for a long time and could earn nothing and could not prevent her she took to singing ballads in taverns and gave lectures that people laughed at and then she wrote a book that she has both laughed and cried over since then all to keep the life in me could i look on when in the winter she who had toiled and drudged for me began to pine away no karsten i couldn't and so i said you go home for a trip lona don't be afraid for me i'm not so flighty as you think and so well, the end of it was that she had to know and how did she take it well she thought as was true that as i knew i was innocent nothing need prevent me from taking a trip over here with her but make your mind easy lona will let nothing out and i shall keep my mouth shut as i did before yes yes i rely on that here's my hand on it and now we will say no more about that old story luckily it is the only mad prank either of us has been guilty of i'm sure i want thoroughly to enjoy the few days i shall stay here you cannot think what a delightful walk we had this morning who would have believed that that little imp who used to run around here and play angels parts on the stage but tell me my dear fellow what became of her parents afterwards oh my boy i can tell you no more than i wrote to you immediately after you went away i suppose you got my two letters yes yes i have them both so that drunken fellow deserted her and drank himself to death afterwards and she died soon afterwards too she was proud she betrayed nothing and would accept nothing well at all events you did the right thing by taking dina into your house i suppose so as a matter of fact it was martha that brought that about so it was martha by the way where is she today she oh when she hasn't her school to look after she has her sick people to see to so it was martha who interested herself in her yes you know martha has always had a certain liking for teaching so she took a post in the boarding school it was very ridiculous of her i thought she looked very worn yesterday i should be afraid her health was not good enough for it no oh, as far as her health goes it is all right enough but it is unpleasant for me it looks as though i her brother were not willing to support her support her i thought she had means enough of her own not a penny surely you remember how badly off our mother was when you went away she carried things on for a time with my assistance but naturally i could not put up with that state of affairs permanently 
i made her take me into the firm but even then things did not go well so i had to take over the whole business myself and when we made up our balance sheet it became evident that there was practically nothing left as my mother's share and when mother died soon afterwards of course martha was left penniless poor martha poor why you surely do not suppose i let her want for anything no i venture to say i am a good brother of course she has a home here with us her salary as a teacher is more than enough for her to dress on what more could she want that's not our idea of things in america no i dare say not in such a revolutionary state of society as you find there but in our small circle in which thank god depravity has not gained a footing up to now at all events women are content to occupy a seemly as well as modest position moreover it is martha's own fault i mean she might have been provided for long ago if she had wished you mean she might have married yes and married very well too she has had several good offers curiously enough when you think that she is a poor girl no longer young and besides quite an insignificant person insignificant oh i'm not blaming her for that i most certainly would not wish her otherwise i can tell you it is always a good thing to have a steady-going person like that in a big house like this some one you can rely on in any contingency yes but what does she she how oh well of course she has plenty to interest herself in she has betty and olaf and me people should not think first of themselves women least of all we have all got some community great or small to work for that is my principle at all events Bernick points to crop who has come in from the right ah here is an example of it ready to hand do you suppose that it is my own affairs that are absorbing me just now by no means to crop well crop in an undertone showing him a bundle of papers here are all the sale contracts completed capital splendid well johann you must really excuse me for the present Bernick, grasping his hand thanks johann thanks and rest assured that anything i can do for you well of course you understand come along crop they go into Bernick's room johann looking after them for a moment hmm. johann turns to go down to the garden at the same moment martha comes in from the right with a little basket over her arm martha ah oh, johann is it you out so early yes wait a moment the others are just coming martha moves toward the door on the left martha are you always in such a hurry i well yesterday you seemed to avoid me so that i had never managed to have a word with you we two old playfellows ah uh, johann that is many many years ago well, good lord why it's only fifteen years ago no more and no less do you think i have changed so much you oh yes you have changed too although what do you mean oh nothing you don't seem to be very glad to see me again i have waited so long johann too long waited for me to come yes and why did you think i would come to atone for the wrong you had done <laughs> i have you forgotten that it was through you that a woman died in need and in shame have you forgotten that it was through you that the best years of a young girl's life were embittered and you can say such things to me martha has your brother never never what has he never oh of course i mean has he never so much as said a word in my defence ah johann you know karsten's high principles hm. oh of course i know my old friend karsten's high principles but really this is well well i was having a talk with him just now he seems to me to have altered considerably how can you say that i am sure karsten has always been an excellent man well yes that's not exactly what i meant but uh, never mind hmm now i understand the light you have seen me in it was the return of the prodigal that you were waiting for johann i will tell you what light i have seen you in 
Martha points down to the garden. Do you see that girl playing on the grass down there with Olaf? That is Dina. Do you remember that incoherent letter you wrote me when you went away? You asked me to believe in you. I have believed in you, Johan. All the horrible things that were rumored about you after you had gone must have been done through being led astray, from thoughtlessness, without premeditation. What do you mean? Oh, you understand me well enough. Not a word more of that. But of course you had to go away and begin afresh, a new life. Your duties here, which you never remembered to undertake, or never were able to undertake, I have undertaken for you. I tell you this so that you shall not have that also to reproach yourself with. I have been a mother to that much wronged child. I have brought her up as well as I was able. And have wasted your whole life for that reason. It has not been wasted, but you have come late, Johann. Martha, if only I could tell you. Well, at all events, let me thank you for your loyal friendship. <laughs> well, we have headed out now, Johann. Hush, someone is coming. Goodbye. I can't stay now. Martha goes out through the farther door on the left. Lona comes in from the garden, followed by Mrs. Burnick. But, good gracious, Lona, what are you thinking of? Let me be, I tell you. I must and will speak to him. But it would be a scandal of the worst sort. Ah, Johann, still here? Out with you, my boy. Don't stay here indoors. Go down into the garden and have a chat with Dina. I was just thinking of doing so. But look here, Johann. Have you had a good look at Dina? I should think so. Well, look at her to some purpose, my boy. That would be somebody for you. But Lona! Somebody for me? Yes. To look at, I mean. Be off with you. Oh, I don't need any pressing. Johann goes down into the garden. Lona! You astound me. You cannot possibly be serious about it. Indeed I am. Isn't she sweet and healthy and honest? She is exactly the wife for Johann. She is just what he needs over there. It will be a change from an old stepsister. Dina? Dina Dorf? But think. I think first and foremost of the boy's happiness. Because help him I must. He has not much idea of that sort of thing. He has never had much of an eye for girls or women. He, Johann? Indeed, I think we have had only two sad proofs that— Oh, devil take all those stupid stories! Where is Karsten? I mean to speak to him. Lona, you must not do it, I tell you. I am going to. If the boy takes a fancy to her and she to him, then they shall make a match of it. Karsten is such a clever man, he must find some way to bring it about. And do you think these American indecencies will be permitted here? Bosh, Betty. Do you think a man like Carsten, with his strictly moral way of thinking? Ha, <laughs> pooh! He is not so terribly moral. What have you the audacity to say? I have the audacity to say that Carsten is not any more particularly moral than anybody else. So you still hate him as deeply as that. But what are you doing here if you have never been able to forget that? I cannot understand how you dare look him in the face after the shameful insult you put upon him in the old days. Yes, Betty, that time I did forget myself badly. And to think how magnanimously he has forgiven you, he who had never done any wrong. It was not his fault that you encouraged yourself with hopes. But since then you have always hated me too. <laughs> you have always begrudged me my good fortune, and now you come here to heap all this on my head, to let the whole town know what sort of a family I have brought Carsten into. Yes, it is me that it all falls upon, and that is what you want. Oh, it is abominable of you. <laughs> Mrs. Burnett goes out by the door on the left, in tears. Lona, looking after her. Poor Betty. Burnett comes in from his room. He stops at the door to speak to Crop. Yes, that is excellent, Crop. Capital. Send twenty pounds to the fund for dinners to the poor. Burnett turns round. Lona. Burnett comes forward. Are you alone? Is Betty not coming in? No. Would you like me to call her? No, no, not at all. Oh, Lona, you don't know how anxious I have been to speak openly to you, after having begged for your forgiveness. 
Look here, Karsten. Do not let us be sentimental. It doesn't suit us. You must listen to me, Lona. I know only too well how much appearances are against me, as you have learnt all about that affair with Dina's mother. But I swear to you that it was only a temporary infatuation. I was really, truly and honestly in love with you once. Why do you think I have come home? Whatever you have in your mind, I entreat you to do nothing until I have exculpated myself. I can do that, Lona. At all events, I can excuse myself. Now you are frightened. You once were in love with me, as you say. Yes, you told me that often enough in your letters. And perhaps it was true, too, in a way. As long as you were living out in the great free world, which gave you the courage to think freely and greatly. Perhaps you found in me a little more character and strength of will and independence than most of the folk at home here. And then we kept it secret between us. Nobody could make fun of your bad taste. Lona, how can you think? But when you came back, when you heard the jibes that were made at me on all sides, when you noticed how people laughed at what they called my absurdities, you were regardless of people's opinion at that time. Chiefly to annoy the petticoated and trousered prudes that one met at every turn in the town. And then, when you met that seductive young actress... It was a boyish escapade, nothing more. I swear to you that there was no truth in a tenth part of the rumors and gossip that went about. Maybe. But then, when Betty came home, a pretty young girl idolized by everyone, and it became known that she would inherit all her aunt's money and that I would have nothing. That is just the point, Lona, and now you shall have the truth without any beating about the bush. I did not love Betty then. I did not break off my engagement with you because of any new attachment. It was entirely for the sake of the money. I needed it. I had to make sure of it. And you have the face to tell me that? Yes, I have. Listen, Lona. And yet you wrote to me that an unconquerable passion for Betty had overcome you, invoked my magnanimity, begged me, for Betty's sake, to hold my tongue about all that had been between us. I had to, I tell you. Oh, now, by heaven, I don't regret that I forgot myself as I did that time. Let me tell you the plain truth of how things stood with me then. My mother, as you remember, was at the head of the business, but she was absolutely without any business ability whatever. I was hurriedly summoned home from Paris. Times were critical, and they relied on me to set things straight. What did I find? I found, and you must keep this a profound secret, a house on the brink of ruin. Yes, as good as on the brink of ruin, this old respected house which had seen three generations of us what else could i the son the only son do than look about for some means of saving it and so you saved the house of burnick at the cost of a woman you know quite well that betty was in love with me but what about me believe me lona you would never have been happy with me <laughs> was it out of consideration for my happiness that you sacrificed me do you suppose i acted as i did from selfish motives if i had stood alone then i would have begun all over again with cheerful courage but you do not understand how the life of a man of business with his tremendous responsibilities is bound up with that of the business which falls to his inheritance do you realize that the prosperity or the ruin of hundreds of thousands depends on him can you not take into consideration the fact that the whole community in which both you and i were born would have been affected to the most dangerous extent if the house of bernick had gone to smash then is it for the sake of the community that you have maintained your position these fifteen years upon a lie upon a lie what does betty know of all this that underlies her union with you do you suppose that I would hurt her feelings to no purpose by disclosing the truth? To no purpose, you say? Well, well. You are a man of business. You ought to understand what is to the purpose. But listen to me, Karsten. I am going to speak the plain truth now. Tell me, are you really happy? 
in my family life do you mean yes i am lona you have not been a self-sacrificing friend to me in vain i can honestly say that i have grown happier every year betty is good and willing and if i were to tell you how in the course of years she has learned to model her character on the lines of my own hmm. at first of course she had a whole lot of romantic notions about love she could not reconcile herself to the idea that little by little it must change into a quiet comradeship but now she is quite reconciled to that absolutely as you can imagine daily intercourse with me has had no small share in developing her character every one in their degree has to learn to lower their own pretensions if they are to live worthily of the community to which they belong and betty in her turn has gradually learned to understand this and that is why our home is now a model to our fellow citizens but your fellow citizens know nothing about the lie the lie yes the lie you have persisted in for these fifteen years do you mean to say that you call that i call it a lie a threefold lie first of all there is the lie towards me then the lie towards betty and then the lie towards johann betty has never asked me to speak because she has known nothing and you will not demand it out of consideration for her oh no i shall manage to put up with their jibes well enough i have broad shoulders and johann will not demand it either he has promised me that but you yourself karsten do you feel within yourself no impulse urging you to shake yourself free of this lie do you suppose that of my own free will i would sacrifice my family happiness and my position in the world what right have you to the position you hold every day during these fifteen years i have earned some little right to it by my conduct and by what i have achieved by my work true you have achieved a great deal by your work for yourself as well as for others you are the richest and most influential man in the town nobody in it dares do otherwise than defer to your will because you are looked upon as a man without spot or blemish your home is regarded as a model home and your conduct as a model of conduct but all this grandeur and you with it is founded on a treacherous morass a moment may come and a word may be spoken when you and all your grandeur will be engulfed in the morass if you do not save yourself in time Lona, what is your object in coming here i want to help you to get firm ground under your feet karsten revenge you want to revenge yourself i suspected it but you won't succeed there is only one person here that can speak with authority and he will be silent you mean johann yes johann if anyone else accuses me i shall deny everything if anyone tries to crush me i shall fight for my life but you will never succeed in that let me tell you the one who could strike me down will say nothing and is going away rummel and vigeland come in from the right good morning my dear verdict good morning you must come up with us to the commercial association there is a meeting about the railway scheme you know i cannot it is impossible just now you really must mr bernick bernick you must there is an opposition to us on foot hammer and the rest of those who believe in a line along the coast are declaring that private interests are at the back of the new proposals well then explain to them our explanations have no effect mr bernick no no you must come yourself naturally no one would dare to suspect you of such duplicity i should think not i cannot i tell you i am not well or at all events wait let me pull myself together rorland comes in from the right excuse me mr bernick but i am terribly upset why what is the matter with you i must put a question to you mr bernick is it with your consent that the young girl who has found a shelter under your roof shows herself in the open street in the company of a person who what person mr parson with a person from whom of all others in the world she ought to be kept furthest apart <laughs> is it with your consent mr bernick bernick looking for his hat and gloves 
i know nothing about it you must excuse me i am in a great hurry i am due at the commercial association hilmar comes up from the garden and goes over to the farther door on the left betty betty i want to speak to you mrs burnick coming to the door what is it you ought to go down into the garden and put a stop to the flirtation that is going on between uh, a certain person and dina dorf it has quite got on my nerves to listen to them indeed and what has the certain person been saying oh only that he wishes she would go off to america with him oh is it possible what do you say but that would be perfectly splendid impossible you cannot have heard right ask him yourself then here comes the pair of them only leave me out of it please to rummel and vigeland i will follow you in a moment rummel and vigeland go out to the right johann and dina come up from the garden hurrah lona she's going with us but johann are you out of your senses can i believe my ears such an atrocious scandal by what arts of seduction have you come come sir what are you saying answer me dina do you mean to do this entirely of your own free will i must get away from here but with him with him can you tell me of any one else here who would have the courage to take me with him very well then you shall learn who he is do not speak not a word more if i did not i would be unworthy to serve a community of whose morals i have been appointed a guardian and should be acting most unjustifiably towards this young girl in whose upbringing i have taken a material part and who is to me take care what you are doing she shall know dina this is the man who was the cause of all your mother's misery and shame mr rorland he to johann is it true carsten you answer not a word more do not let us say another word about it to-day then it is true yes it is true and more than that this fellow whom you were going to trust did not run away from home empty-handed ask him about old mrs burnick's cash box mr burnick can bear witness to that liar ah <sighs> my god my god johann rushing at roarland with uplifted arm and you dare to lona restraining him do not strike him johann that is right assault me but the truth will out and it is the truth mr burnick has admitted it and the whole town knows it now dina you know him johann grasping burnick by the arm carsten carsten what have you done oh carsten to think that i should have mixed you up in all this disgrace Samstad coming in hurriedly from the right and calling out with his hand still on the door handle you positively must come now mr burnick the fate of the whole railway is hanging by a thread what is it what have i to you have to go and be a pillar of society brother-in-law yes come along we need the full weight of your moral excellence on our side aside to burnick carsten we will have a talk about this tomorrow johann goes out through the garden burnick looking half dazed goes out to the right with sonstadt end of act two society by henrik ibsen translated by r farquharson sharp this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene: The same room. Burnick, with a cane in his hand and evidently in a great rage, comes out of the farther room on the left, leaving the door half open behind him. Burnick, speaking to his wife, who is in the other room. There, I have given it him in earnest. Now I don't think he will forget that thrashing. What do you say? and i say that you are an injudicious mother you make excuses for him and countenance any sort of rascality on his part not rascality what do you call it then slipping out of the house at night going out in a fishing boat staying away till well on in the day and giving me such a horrible fright when i have so much to worry me and then the young scamp has the audacity to threaten that he will run away just let him try it 
you no very likely you don't trouble yourself much about what happens to him i really believe that he were to get killed oh really well i have work to leave behind me in the world i have no fancy for being left childless now do not raise objections betty it shall be as i say he is confined to the house Bernick listens hush do not let anyone notice anything crop comes in from the right can you spare me a moment mr Burnick? Burnick, throwing away the cane certainly certainly have you come from the yard uh, yes <clears throat> well nothing wrong with the palm tree i hope uh, the palm tree can sail tomorrow but it is the indian girl then i had a suspicion that that obstinate fellow the indian girl can sail tomorrow too but i'm sure she will not get very far what do you mean excuse me sir that door is standing ajar and i think there is someone in the other room Burnick, shutting the door there then but what is this that no one else must hear just this that i believe Aun intends to let the indian girl go to the bottom with every mother's son on board good god what makes you think that i cannot account for it any other way sir well tell me as briefly as you can i will you know yourself how slowly the work has gone on in the yard since we got the new machines and the new inexperienced hands yes yes but this morning when i went down there i noticed that the repairs to the american boat had made extraordinary progress the great hole in the bottom uh, the rotten patch you know yes yes what about it it was completely repaired to all appearance at any rate covered up looked as good as new i heard that aona himself had been working at it by lantern light the whole night yes yes well i turned it over in my head for a bit the hands were away at their breakfast so i found an opportunity to have a look around the boat both outside and in without anyone seeing me i had a job to get down to the bottom through the cargo but i learned the truth there is something very suspicious going on mr Burnick. i cannot believe it crop i cannot and will not believe such a thing of Aunna. i am very sorry but it's the simple truth something very suspicious is going on no new timbers put in as far as i could see only stopped up and tinkered at and covered over with sailcloth and tarpaulins and that sort of thing an absolute fraud the indian girl will never get to new york she will go to the bottom like a cracked pot this is most horrible but what can be his object do you suppose probably he wants to bring the machines into discredit wants to take his revenge wants to force you to take the old hands on again and to do this he is willing to sacrifice the lives of all on board he said the other day that there were no men on board the indian girl only wild beasts yes but apart from that has he no regard for the great loss of capital it would mean Aona does not look upon capital with a very friendly eye, Mr. Burnick. That is perfectly true. He is an agitator and a fomenter of discontent. But such an unscrupulous thing as this. Look here, Crop. You must look into the matter once more. Not a word of it to anyone. The blame will fall on our yard if anyone hears anything of it. Of course, but when the hands are away at their dinner you must manage to get down there again i must have absolute certainty about it you shall sir but excuse me what do you propose to do report the affair naturally we cannot of course let ourselves become accomplices in such a crime i would not have such a thing on my conscience moreover it will make a good impression both on the press and on the public in general if it is seen that i set all personal interests aside and let justice take its course quite true mr Burnick. but first of all i must be absolutely certain and meanwhile do not breathe a word of it not a word sir and you shall have your certainty crop goes out through the garden and down the street shocking but no it is impossible inconceivable as Burnick turns to go into his room hilmar comes in from the right good morning carlston let me congratulate you on your triumph at the commercial association yesterday thank you it was a brilliant triumph i hear the triumph of intelligent public spirit over selfishness and prejudice 
something like a raid of French troops on the Kabyles. It is astonishing that after the unpleasant scene here you could— Yes, yes, quite so. But the decisive battle has not been fought yet. In the matter of the railway, do you mean? Yes. I suppose you know the trouble that Hammer is brewing? No, what is that? Oh, he is greatly taken up with the rumour that is going round, and is preparing to dish up an article about it. What rumour? About the extensive purchase of property along the branch line, of course. What, is there such a rumour as that going about? It is all over the town. I heard it at the club when I looked in there. They say that one of our lawyers has quietly bought up, on commission, all the forest land, all the mining land, all the waterfalls. Don't they say whom it was for? At the club they thought it must be for some company, not connected with this town, that has got a hint of the scheme you have in hand, and has made haste to buy before the price of these properties went up. Isn't it villainous? Ugh. Villainous? Yes, to have strangers putting their fingers into our pie, and one of our own local lawyers lending himself to such a thing. And now it will be outsiders that will get all the profits. But after all, it is only an idle rumour. Meanwhile, people are believing it, and tomorrow, or the next day, I have no doubt Hammer will nail it to the counter as a fact. There is a general sense of exasperation in the town already. I have heard several people say that if the rumour were confirmed, they would take their names off the subscription lists. Impossible. Is it? Why do you suppose these mercenary-minded creatures were so willing to go into the undertaking with you? Don't you suppose they have scented profit for themselves? It is impossible, I am sure. There is so much public spirit in our little community. In our community? Of course, you are a confirmed optimist, and so you judge others by yourself. But I, who am a tolerably experienced observer, there isn't a single soul in the place excepting ourselves, of course, not a single soul in the place who holds up the banner of the ideal. Hilmar goes toward the veranda. Ugh! I can see them there. See whom? Our two friends from America. Hilmar looks out to the right. And who is that they are walking with? As I am alive, if it is not the captain of the Indian girl. Oh! What can they want with him? Oh, he is just the right company for them. He looks as if he had been a slaveholder or a pirate, and who knows what the other two may have been doing all these years. Let me tell you that it is grossly unjust to think such things about them. Yes, you are an optimist. But here they are, bearing down upon us again, so I will get away while there is time. Hilmar goes toward the door on the left. Lona comes in from the right. Oh, Hilmar, am I driving you away? Oh, not at all. I am in rather a hurry. I want to have a word with Betty. Hilmar goes into the farthest room on the left. Well, Lona? Yes? What do you think of me today? The same as I did yesterday. A lie, more or less. I must enlighten you about it. Where has Johan gone? He is coming. He had to see a man first. After what you heard yesterday, you will understand that my whole life will be ruined if the truth comes to light. I can understand that. Of course, it stands to reason that I was not guilty of the crime there was so much talk about here. That stands to reason. But who was the thief? There was no thief. There was no money stolen, not a penny. How is that? Not a penny, I tell you. But those rumors! How did that shameful rumor get about that Johann— Lona, I think I can speak to you as I could to no one else. I will conceal nothing from you. I was partly to blame for spreading the rumor. You? You could act in that way towards a man who for your sake— Do not condemn me without bearing in mind how things stood at that time. I told you about it yesterday. I came home and found my mother involved in a mesh of injudicious undertakings. We had all manner of bad luck. It seemed as if misfortunes were raining upon us, and our house was on the verge of ruin. I was half reckless and half in despair. 
lona i believe it was mainly to deaden my thoughts that i let myself drift into that entanglement that ended in johann's going away hmm. you can well imagine how every kind of rumor was set on foot after you and he had gone people began to say that it was not his first piece of folly that dorf had received a large sum of money to hold his tongue and go away other people said that she had received it at the same time it was obvious that our house was finding it difficult to meet its obligations what was more natural than that scandal-mongers should find some connection between these two rumors and as the woman remained here living in poverty people declared that he had taken the money with him to america and every time rumor mentioned the sum it grew larger and you karsten i grasped at the rumor like a drowning man at a straw you helped to spread it i did not contradict it our creditors had begun to be pressing and i had the task of keeping them quiet the result was the dissipating of any suspicion as to the stability of the firm people said that we had been hit by a temporary piece of ill luck that all that was necessary was that they should not press us only give us time and every creditor would be paid in full and every creditor was paid in full yes lona that rumor saved our house and made me the man i now am that is to say a lie has made you the man you now are whom did it injure at the time it was johann's intention never to come back you ask whom it injured look into your own heart and tell me if it has not injured you look into any man's heart you please and you will always find in every one at least one black spot which he has to keep concealed and you call yourselves pillars of society society has none better and of what consequence is it whether such a society be propped up or not what does it all consist of show and lies and nothing else here are you the first man in the town living in grandeur and luxury powerful and respected you who have branded an innocent man as a criminal do you suppose i am not deeply conscious of the wrong i have done him and do you suppose i am not ready to make amends to him for it how by speaking out would you have the heart to insist on that what else can make amends for such a wrong i am rich lona johann can demand any sum he pleases oh yes offer him money and you will hear what he will say do you know what he intends to do no since yesterday he has been dumb he looks as if this has made a grown man of him all at once i must talk to him here he comes johann comes in from the right Burnick going towards him johann johann motioning him away listen to me first yesterday morning i gave you my word that i would hold my tongue you did but then i did not know johann only let me say a word or two to explain the circumstances it's unnecessary i understand the circumstances perfectly the firm was in a dangerous position at the time i had gone off and you had my defenseless name and reputation at your mercy well i don't blame you so very much for what you did we were young and thoughtless in those days but now i have need of the truth and now you must speak and just now i have need of all my reputation for morality and therefore i cannot speak i don't take much account of the false reports you spread about me it is the other thing that you must take the blame of i shall make dina my wife and here here in your town i mean to settle down and live with her is that what you mean to do with dina dina as your wife in this town yes here and nowhere else i mean to stay here to defy all these liars and slanderers but before i can win her you must exonerate me have you considered that if i confess to the one thing it will inevitably mean making myself responsible for the other as well you will say that i can show by our books that nothing dishonest happened but i cannot our books were not so accurately kept in those days and even if i could what good would it do should i not in any case be pointed at as the man who had once saved himself by an untruth 
and for fifteen years had allowed that untruth and all its consequences to stand without having raised a finger to demolish it you do not know our community very much or you would realize that it would ruin me utterly i can only tell you that i mean to make mrs dorf's daughter my wife and live with her in this town Bernick, wiping the perspiration from his forehead listen to me johann and you too lona the circumstances i am in just now are quite exceptional i am situated in such a way that if you aim this blow at me you will not only destroy me but will also destroy a great future rich in blessings that lies before the community which after all was the home of your childhood and if i do not aim this blow at you i shall be destroying all my future happiness with my own hand go on karsten i will tell you then it is mixed up with the railway project and the whole thing is not quite so simple as you think i suppose you have heard that last year there was some talk of a railway line along the coast many influential people backed up the idea people in the town and the suburbs and especially the press but i managed to get the proposal quashed on the ground that it would have injured our steamboat trade along the coast have you any interest in the steamboat trade yes but no one ventured to suspect me on that account my honored name fully protected me from that for the matter of that i could have stood the loss but the place could not have stood it so the inland line was decided upon as soon as that was done i assured myself without saying anything about it that a branch line could be laid to the town why did you say nothing about it karsten have you heard the rumors of extensive buying up of forest lands mines and waterfalls yes apparently it is some company from another part of the country as these properties are situated at present they are as good as valueless to their owners who are scattered about the neighborhood they have therefore been sold comparatively cheap if the purchaser had waited till the branch line began to be talked of the proprietors would have asked exorbitant prices well what then now i'm going to tell you something that can be construed in different ways a thing to which in our community a man could only confess provided he had an untarnished and honored name to take his stand upon well it is i that have bought up the whole of them you on your own account on my own account if the branch line becomes an accomplished fact i am a millionaire if it does not i am ruined why it is a big risk karsten i have risked my whole fortune on it i am not thinking of your fortune but if it comes to light that yes that is the critical part of it with the unblemished and honored name i have hitherto borne i can take the whole thing upon my shoulders carry it through and say to my fellow-citizens see i have taken this risk for the good of the community of the community yes and not a soul will doubt my motives then some of those concerned in it have acted more openly without any secret motives or considerations who why of course rummel and sandstad and Vigeland. to get them on my side i was obliged to let them into the secret and they they have stipulated for a fifth part of the profits as their share oh these pillars of society and isn't it society itself that forces us to use these underhanded means what would have happened if i had not acted secretly everybody would have wanted to have a hand in the undertaking the whole thing would have been divided up mismanaged and bungled there is not a single man in the town except myself who is capable of directing so big an affair as this will be in this country almost without exception it is only foreigners who have settled here who have the aptitude for big business schemes that is the reason why my conscience acquits me in the matter it is only in my hands that these properties can become a real blessing to the many who have to make their daily bread i believe you are right there karsten but i have no concern with the many and my life's happiness is at stake the welfare of your native place is also at stake if things come out which cast reflections on my earlier conduct then all my opponents will fall upon me with united vigor 
a youthful folly is never allowed to be forgotten in our community they would go through the whole of my previous life bring up a thousand little incidents in it interpret and explain them in the light of what has been revealed they would crush me under the weight of rumors and slanders i should be obliged to abandon the railway scheme and if i take my hand off that it will come to nothing and i shall be ruined and my life as a citizen will be over johann after what we have just heard you must go away from here and hold your tongue yes yes johann you must yes i will go away and i will hold my tongue but i shall come back and then i shall speak stay over there johann hold your tongue and i am willing to share with you keep your money but give me back my name and reputation and sacrifice my own you and your community must get out of that the best way you can i must and shall win dina for my wife and therefore i'm going to sail tomorrow in the indian girl in the indian girl yes the captain has promised to take me i shall go over to america as i say i shall sell my farm and set my affairs in order in two months i shall be back and then you will speak then the guilty man must take his guilt on himself have you forgotten that if i do that i must also take on myself guilt that is not mine who is it that for the last fifteen years has benefited by that shameful rumor you will drive me to desperation well if you speak i shall deny everything i shall say it is a plot against me that you have come back here to blackmail me for shame karsten i am a desperate man i tell you and i shall fight for my life i shall deny everything everything i have your two letters i found them in my box among my other papers this morning i read them again they're plain enough and will you make them public if it becomes necessary and you will be back here in two months i hope so the wind is fair in three weeks i shall be in new york if the indian girl does not go to the bottom go to the bottom why should the indian girl go to the bottom quite so why should she go to the bottom well karsten now you know what is before you you must find your own way out good-bye you can say good-bye to betty for me although she has not treated me like a sister but i must see martha she shall tell dina she shall promise me johann goes out through the farther door on the left the indian girl look you must prevent that you see for yourself karsten i have no influence over him any longer lona follows johann into the other room go to the bottom one comes in from the right excuse me sir but if it is convenient bernick turning round angrily what do you want to know if i may ask you a question sir be quick about it then what is it i wanted to ask if i am to consider it certain absolutely certain that i should be dismissed from the yard if the indian girl were not ready to sail to-morrow what do you mean the ship is ready to sail yes it is but suppose it were not should i be discharged what is the use of asking such idle questions only that i would like to know sir will you answer me that should i be discharged am i in the habit of keeping my word or not then to-morrow i should have lost the position i hold in my house and among those near and dear to me lost my influence over men of my own class lost all opportunity of doing anything for the cause of the poorer and needier members of the community Anna, we have discussed all that before quite so then the indian girl will sail look here it is impossible for me to have my eyes everywhere i cannot be answerable for everything you can give me your assurance i suppose that the repairs have been satisfactorily carried out you gave me very short grace mr vernick but i understand you to warrant the repairs the weather is fine 
and it is summer have you anything else to say to me i think not sir then the indian girl will sail tomorrow yes very good one bows and goes out Burnick stands for a moment irresolute then walks quickly toward the door as if to call one back but stops hesitatingly with his hand on the door handle at that moment the door is opened from without and crop comes in aha he has been here has he confessed hmm. have you discovered anything what need of that sir could you not see the evil conscience looking out of the man's eyes nonsense such things don't show have you discovered anything i want to know i could not manage it i was too late they had already begun hauling the ship out of the dock but their very haste in doing that plainly shows that there it shows nothing has the inspection taken place then of course but there you see and of course they found nothing to complain of mr burnick you know very well how much this inspection means especially in a yard that has such a good name as ours has no matter it takes all responsibility off us but sir could you really not tell from auna's manner that auna has completely reassured me let me tell you and let me tell you sir that i am morally certain that what does this mean crop i see plainly enough that you want to get your knife into this man but if you want to attack him you must find some other occasion you know how important it is to me or i should say to the owners that the indian girl should sail to-morrow very well so be it but if ever we hear of that ship again <clears throat> vigeland comes in from the right i wish you a very good morning mr burnick have you a moment to spare at your service mr vigeland i only want to know if you are also of opinion that the palm tree should sail to-morrow certainly i thought that was quite settled well the captain came to me just now and told me that storm signals have been hoisted oh are we to expect a storm a stiff breeze at all events but not a contrary wind just the opposite hmm. well what do you say i say as i said to the captain that the palm tree is in the hands of providence besides they're only going across the north sea at first and in england freights are running tolerably high just now so that yes it would probably mean a loss for us if we waited besides she is a stout ship and fully insured as well it is more risky now for the indian girl what do you mean she sails tomorrow too yes the owners have been in such a hurry and besides well if that old hulk can venture out and with such a crew into the bargain it would be a disgrace for us if we quite so i presume you have the ship's papers with you yes here they are good then will you go in with mr crop will you come in here sir and we will dispose of them at once thank you and the issue we leave in the hands of the almighty mr burnick Vigeland goes with crop into burnick's room rorland comes up from the garden at home at this time of day mr burnick as you see it was really on your wife's account i came i thought she might be in need of a word of comfort very likely she is but i want to have a little talk with you too with the greatest of pleasure mr burnick but what is the matter with you you look quite pale and upset really do i well what else could you expect a man so loaded with responsibilities as i am there is all my own big business and now the planning of this railway but tell me something mr rorland let me put a question to you with pleasure mr burnick it is about a thought which has occurred to me suppose a man is face to face with an undertaking which will concern the welfare of thousands and suppose it should be necessary to make a sacrifice of one what do you mean for example suppose a man were thinking of starting a large factory he knows for certain because all his experience has taught him so that sooner or later a toll of human life will be exacted in the working of that factory yes that is only too probable or say a man embarks on a mining enterprise he takes into his service fathers of families and young men in the first flush of their youth is it not quite safe to predict that all of them will not come out of it alive yes unhappily that is quite true well 
a man in that position will know beforehand that the undertaking he proposes to start must undoubtedly at some time or other mean a loss of human life but the undertaking itself is for the public good for every man's life that it costs it will undoubtedly promote the welfare of many hundreds ah you are thinking of the railway of all the dangerous excavating and blasting and that sort of thing yes quite so i am thinking of the railway and besides the coming of the railway will mean the starting of factories and mines but do not think nevertheless my dear mr burnick you are almost over conscientious what i think is that if you place the affair in the hands of providence yes exactly providence you are blameless in the matter go on and build your railway hopefully yes but now i will put a special instance to you suppose a charge of blasting powder had to be exploded in a dangerous place and that unless it were exploded the line could not be constructed suppose the engineer knew that it would cost the life of the workman who lit the fuse but that it had to be lit and that it was the engineer's duty to send a workman to do it hmm. i know what you will say it would be a splendid thing if the engineer took the match himself and went and lit the fuse but that is out of the question so he must sacrifice a workman that is a thing no engineer here would ever do no engineer in the bigger countries would think twice about doing it in the bigger countries no i can quite believe it in those depraved and unprincipled communities oh there's a good deal to be said for those communities can you say that you who yourself in the bigger communities a man finds space to carry out a valuable project finds the courage to make some sacrifice in a great cause but here a man is cramped by all kinds of petty considerations and scruples is human life a petty consideration when that human life threatens the welfare of thousands but you are suggesting cases that are quite inconceivable mr burnick i do not understand you at all to-day and you quote the bigger countries well what do they think of human life there they look upon it simply as part of the capital they have to use but we look at things from a somewhat different moral standpoint i should hope look at our respected shipping industry can you name a single one of our ship owners who would sacrifice a human life for the sake of paltry gain and then think of those scoundrels in the bigger countries who for the sake of profit send out freights in one unseaworthy ship after another i am not talking of unseaworthy ships but i am mr burnick yes but to what purpose they have nothing to do with the question oh these small timid considerations if a general from this country were to take his men under fire and some of them were shot i suppose he would have sleepless nights after it it is not so in other countries you should hear what that fellow in there says he who the american yes you should hear how in america he in there and you did not tell me i shall at once it is no use you won't be able to do anything with him we shall see ah here he comes johann comes in from the other room johann talking back through the open door yes yes dina as you please but i do not mean to give you up all the same i shall come back and then everything will come right between us excuse me but what did you mean by that what is it you propose to do i propose that that young girl before whom you blackened my character yesterday shall become my wife your wife and can you really suppose that i mean to marry her well then you shall know the truth rorland goes to the half-open door mrs burnick will you be so kind as to come and be a witness and you too miss martha and let dina come rorland sees lona at the door ah you here too shall i come too as many as you please the more the better what are you going to do lona mrs burnick martha dina and hilmar come in from the other room mr rowland i have tried my hardest but i cannot prevent him i shall prevent him mrs burnick dina you are a thoughtless girl but i do not blame you so greatly you have too long lacked the necessary moral support that should have sustained you i blame myself for not having afforded you that support you mustn't speak now 
What is it? It is now that I must speak, Dina, though your conduct yesterday and today has made it ten times more difficult for me. But all other considerations must give way to the necessity for saving you. You remember that I gave you my word. You remember what you promised you would answer when I judged the right time had come? Now I dare not hesitate any longer, and therefore... Rorland turns to Johann. This young girl, whom you are persecuting, is my betrothed. What? Dina. She? Your... No, no, Dina. It is a lie. Dina? Is this man speaking the truth? Yes. I hope this has rendered all your arts of seduction powerless. The step I have determined to take for Dina's good, I now wish openly proclaimed to everyone. I cherish the certain hope that it will not be misinterpreted. And now, Mrs. Burnick, I think it will be best for us to take her away from here, and try to bring back peace and tranquility to her mind. Yes, come with me. Oh, Dina, what a lucky girl you are. Mrs. Burnick takes Dina out to the left. Rorland follows them. Goodbye, Johann. Martha goes out. Hilmar at the veranda door. Hmm. I really must say. Lona, who has followed Dina with her eyes to Johann. Don't be downhearted, my boy. I shall stay here and keep my eye on the parson. Lona goes out to the right. Johann, you won't sail in the Indian girl now? Indeed I shall. But you won't come back? I am coming back. After this? What have you to do here after this? Revenge myself on you all. Crush as many of you as I can. Johann goes out to the right. Vigeland and Krop come in from Burnick's room. There, now the papers are in order, Mr. Burnick. Good. Good. And I suppose it is settled that the Indian girl is to sail tomorrow? Yes. Burnick goes into his room. Vigeland and Krop go out to the right. Hilmar is just going after them when Olaf puts his head carefully out of the door on the left. Uncle! Uncle Hilmar! Uh, is it you? Why did you stay upstairs? You know you are confined to the house. Olaf, coming a step or two nearer. Hush! Uncle Hilmer, have you heard the news? Yes, I've heard that you got a thrashing today. Olaf, looking threateningly towards his father's room. He shan't thrash me any more. But have you heard that Uncle Johann is going to sail tomorrow with the Americans? What has that got to do with you? You had better run upstairs again. Perhaps I shall be going for a buffalo hunt, too, one of these days, Uncle. Rubbish! A coward like you. Yes, just you wait. You'll learn something tomorrow. Duffer. Hilmar goes out through the garden. Olaf runs into the room again and shuts the door, as he sees Krop coming in from the right. Krop, going to the door of Burnick's room and opening it slightly. Excuse my bothering you again, Mr. Burnick, but there's a tremendous storm blowing up. Krop waits a moment, but there is no answer. Is the Indian girl to sail, for all that? After a short pause, the following answer is heard. The Indian girl is to sail, for all that. Krop shuts the door and goes out again to the right. End of Act Three of Society by Henrik Ibsen. Translated by R. Farquharson Sharp. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 4. Scene. The same room. The work table has been taken away. It is a stormy evening and already dusk. Darkness sets in as the following scene is in progress. A manservant is lighting the chandeliers. Two maids bring in pots of flowers, lamps, and candles, which they place on tables and stands along the walls. Rummel, in dress clothes, with gloves and a white tie, is standing in the room giving instructions to the servants. Only every other candle, Jacob. It must not look as if it were arranged for the occasion. It has to come as a surprise, you know. And all these flowers? Oh, well, let them be. It will probably look as if they stood there every day. Burnick comes out of his room. Burnick, stopping at the door. 
what does this mean oh dear is it you to the servants yes you might leave us for the present the servants go out but rummel what is the meaning of this it means that the proudest moment of your life has come a procession of his fellow citizens is coming to do honor to the first man of the town what in procession with banners and a band we ought to have had torches too but we did not like to risk that in this stormy weather there will be illuminations and that always sounds well in the newspapers listen rummel i won't have anything to do with this but it is too late now they will be here in half an hour but why did you not tell me about this before just because i was afraid you would raise objections to it but i consulted your wife she allowed me to take charge of the arrangements while she looks after the refreshments Burnick, listening what is that noise are they coming already i fancy i hear singing rummel going to the veranda door singing oh that is only the americans the indian girl is being towed out towed out oh yes no rummel i cannot this evening i am not well you certainly do look bad but you must pull yourself together devil take it you must sandstadt and vagiland and i all attach the greatest importance to carrying this thing through we have got to crush our opponents under the weight of as complete an expression of public opinion as possible rumors are getting about the town our announcement about the purchase of the property cannot be withheld any longer it is imperative that this very evening after songs and speeches amidst the clink of glasses in a word in an ebullient atmosphere of festivity you should inform them of the risk you have incurred for the good of the community in such an ebullient atmosphere of festivity as i just now described it you can do an astonishing lot with the people here you must have that atmosphere or the thing won't go yes yes and especially when so delicate and ticklish a point has to be negotiated well thank goodness you have a name that will be a tower of strength burnick but listen now we must make our arrangements to some extent mr hilmar tonneson who has written an ode to you it begins very charmingly with the words raise the ideals banner high and uh, mr roland has undertaken the task of making the speech of the evening of course you must reply to that i cannot to-night rummel couldn't you it is impossible however willing i might be because as you can imagine his speech will be especially addressed to you of course it is possible he may say a word or two about the rest of us i have spoken to vigeland and uh, sandstadt about it our idea is that in replying you should propose the toast of prosperity to our community sandstadt will say a few words on the subject of harmonious relations between the different strata of society then vigeland will express the hope that this new undertaking may not disturb the sound moral basis upon which our community stands and i propose in a few suitable words to refer to the ladies whose work for the community though more inconspicuous is far from being without its importance but you are not listening to me yes indeed i am but tell me do you think that there is a very heavy sea running outside why are you nervous about the palm tree she is fully insured you know yes she is insured but and in good repair and that is the main thing hmm. supposing anything does happen to a ship it doesn't follow that human life will be in danger does it the ship and the cargo may be lost and one may lose one's boxes and papers good lord boxes and papers are not of much consequence not of much consequence no no i only meant hush i hear voices again it is on board the palm tree vigeland comes in from the right yes they are just towing the palm tree out good evening mr burnick and you as a seafaring man are still of opinion that 
"'I put my trust in Providence, Mr. Burnick. Moreover, I have been on board myself and distributed a few small tracts which I hope may carry a blessing with them.' Sonstad and Krop come in from the right. Sonstad to someone at the door. "'Well, if that gets through all right, anything will.' Sonstad comes in. "'Ah, good evening, good evening.' "'Is anything the matter, Krop? "'I say nothing, Mr. Burnick. The entire crew of the India girl are drunk. I will stake my reputation on it, that they won't come out of it alive. Lona comes in from the right. Ah, now I can say his goodbyes for him. Is he on board already? He will be directly at any rate. We parted outside the hotel. And he persists in his intention? As firm as a rock. Rummel, who is fumbling at the window, Ah, confound thee, newfangled contrivances. I cannot get the curtains drawn. Do you want them drawn? I thought on the contrary. Yes, drawn at first, Miss Hessel. You know what is in the wind, I suppose. Yes, let me help you. Lona takes hold of the cords. I will draw down the curtains on my brother-in-law, though I would much rather draw them up. You can do that, too, later on. When the garden is filled with the surging crowd, then the curtains shall be drawn back, and they will be able to look in upon a surprised and happy family. Citizens' lives should be such that they can live in glass houses. Burnick opens his mouth as though he were going to say something, but he turns hurriedly away and goes into his room. Come along. Let us have a final consultation. Come in too, Mr. Crop. You must assist us with information on one or two points of detail. All the men go into Burnick's room. Lona has drawn the curtains over the windows and is just going to do the same over the glass door when Olaf jumps down from the room above onto the garden steps. He has a wrap over his shoulders and a bundle in his hand. Oh, bless me, child, how you frightened me. Olaf, hiding his bundle. Hush, aunt. Did you jump out of the window? Where are you going? Hush, don't say anything. I want to go to Uncle Johann. Only on to the key, you know, only to say good-bye to him. Good night, aunt. Olaf runs out through the garden. No, stop. Olaf, Olaf. Johan, dressed for his journey with a bag over his shoulder, comes warily in by the door on the right. Lona. Lona turning round. What, back again? I still have a few minutes. I must see her once more. We can't part like this. The farther door on the left opens and Martha and Dina, both with cloaks on, and the latter carrying a small traveling bag in her hand, come in. Let me go to him. Let me go to him. Yes, you shall go to him, Dina. There he is. Dina, take me with you. What? You mean it? Yes, take me with you. The other has written to me he means to announce to everyone this evening. Dina, you don't love him? I have never loved the man. I would rather drown myself in the fjord than be engaged to him. Oh, how he humiliated me yesterday, with his condescending manner! How clear he made it that he felt he was lifting up a poor despised creature to his own level! I do not mean to be despised any longer. I mean to go away. May I go with you? Yes, yes, a thousand times, yes! I will not be a burden to you long. Only help me get over there. Help me to go the right way about things at first. Hurrah! Ha! It's all right after all, Dina. Lona, pointing to Burnick's door. Hush! Gently! Gently! Dina, I shall look after you. I am not going to let you do that. I mean to look after myself. Over there I am sure I can do that. Only let me get away from here. Oh, these women! You don't know. They have written to me today, to exhorting me to realize my good fortune impressing on me how magnanimous he has been to-morrow and every day afterwards they would be watching me to see if i were making myself worthy of it all i am sick and tired of all this goodness tell me dina is that the only reason you're coming away am i nothing to you yes johan you are more to me than anyone else in the world oh dina everyone here tells me i ought to hate and detest you that is my duty but I cannot see that it is my duty, and shall never be able to. No more you shall, my dear. No, indeed you shall not, and that is why you shall go with him as his wife. Yes, 
yes what oh give me a kiss martha i never expected that from you no i dare say not i would not have expected it myself but i was bound to break out some time ah what we suffer under the tyranny of habit and custom make a stand against that dina be his wife let me see you defy all this convention what is your answer dina yes i will be your wife oh, dina but first of all i want to work to make something of myself as you have done i am not going to be merely a thing that is taken quite right that is the way very well i, I shall wait and and hope and win my boy but now you must get on board <laughs> yes on board ah lona my dear sister just one word with you johann takes her into the background and talks hurriedly to her dina you lucky girl let me look at you and kiss you once more for the last time not for the last time no my darling aunt we shall meet again never promise me dina never to come back martha grasps her hands and looks at her now go to your happiness my dear child across the sea how often in my schoolroom i have yearned to be over there it must be beautiful the skies are loftier than here a freer air plays about your head oh aunt martha some day you will follow us i never never i have my little vocation here and now i really believe i can live to the full the life that i ought i cannot imagine being parted from you ah uh, one can part from much dina martha kisses her but i hope you may never experience that my sweet child promise me to make him happy i will promise nothing i hate promises things must happen as they will yes yes that is true only remain what you are true and faithful to yourself i will aunt lona putting into her pocket some papers that johann has given her splendid splendid my dear boy but now you must be off look here yes we have no time to waste now good-bye lona and thank you for all your love good-bye martha and thank you too for your loyal friendship good-bye johann good-bye dina and may you be happy all your lives martha and lona hurry them to the door at the back johann and dina go quickly down the steps and through the garden lona shuts the door and draws the curtains over it now we are alone martha you have lost her and i him you lost him no i had already half lost him over there the boy was longing to stand on his own feet that was why i pretended to be suffering from homesickness so that was it ah then i understand why you came but he will want you back lona an old stepsister what use will he have for her now men break many very dear ties to win their happiness that sometimes is so but we two will stick together martha can i be anything to you who more so we two foster sisters haven't we both lost our children now we are alone yes alone and therefore you ought to know this too i loved him more than anything in the world martha lona grasps her by the arm is that true all my existence lies in those words i have loved him and waited for him every summer i waited for him to come and then he came but he had no eyes for me you loved him and it was you yourself that put his happiness into his hands ought i not to be the one to put his happiness into his hands since i loved him yes i have loved him all my life has been for him ever since he went away what reason had i to hope you mean oh i think i had some reason all the same but when he came back then it seemed as if everything had been wiped out of his memory he had no eyes for me it was dina that overshadowed you martha and it is a good thing she did at the time he went away we were of the same age but when i saw him again oh that dreadful moment i realized that now i was ten years older than he 
he had gone out into the bright sparkling sunshine and breathed in youth and health with every breath and here i sat meanwhile spinning and spinning spinning the thread of his happiness martha yes it was a golden thread i spun no bitterness we have been two good sisters to him haven't we lona lona throwing her arms round her martha Burnick comes in from his room so the other men who are in his room yes yes arrange it any way you please when the time comes i shall be able to Burnick shuts the door ah you are here look here martha i think you had better change your dress and tell betty to do the same i don't want anything elaborate of course something homely but neat but you must make haste and a bright cheerful face martha your eyes must look happy olaf is to come downstairs too i will have him beside me hmm. olaf i will give betty your message martha goes out by the farther door on the left well the great and solemn moment is at hand Burnick walking uneasily up and down yes it is at such a moment i should think a man would feel proud and happy Burnick looking at her hmm i hear the whole town is to be illuminated yes they have some idea of that sort all the different clubs will assemble with their banners your name will blaze out in letters of fire tonight the telegraph will flash the news to every part of the country in the bosom of his happy family mr burnick received the homage of his fellow citizens as one of the pillars of society that is so and they will begin to cheer outside and the crowd will shout in front of my house until i shall be obliged to go out and bow to them and thank them obliged to do you suppose i shall feel happy at that moment no i don't suppose you will feel so very happy lona you despise me not yet and you have no right to no right to despise me lona you can have no idea how utterly alone i stand in this cramped and stunted community where i have had year after year to stifle my ambition for a fuller life my work may seem many-sided but what have i really accomplished odds and ends scraps they would not stand anything else here if i were to go a step in advance of the opinions and views that are current at the moment i should lose all my influence do you know what we are we who are looked upon as pillars of society we are nothing more nor less than the tools of society why have you only begun to realize that now because i have been thinking a great deal lately since you came back and this evening i have thought more seriously than ever before oh lona why did not i really know you then in the old days i mean and if you had i should never have let you go and if i had had you i should not be in the position i am in to-night and do you never consider what she might have been to you she whom you chose in my place i know at all events that she has been nothing to me of what i needed because you have never shared your interests with her because you have never allowed her full and frank exchange of thoughts with you because you have allowed her to be borne under by self-reproach for the shame you cast upon one who was dear to her yes yes it all comes from lying and deceit then why not break with all this lying and deceit now it is too late now lona karsten tell me what gratification does all this show and deception bring you it brings me none i must disappear some day and all this community of bunglers with me but a generation is growing up that will follow us it is my son that i work for i am providing a career for him there will come a time when truth will enter into the life of the community and on that foundation he shall build up a happier existence than his father with a lie at the bottom of it all consider what sort of an inheritance it is that you are leaving to your son it is a thousand times worse than you think but surely some day the curse must be lifted and yet nevertheless how could i bring all this upon my own head still it is done now i must go on with it now 
you shall not succeed in crushing me hilmar comes in hurriedly and agitatedly from the right with an open letter in his hand but this is betty betty what is the matter are they coming already no no but i must speak to some one immediately hilmar goes out through the farther door on the left karsten you talk about our having come here to crush you so let me tell you what sort of stuff this prodigal son whom your moral community shuns as if he had the plague is made of he can do without any of you for he is away now but he said he meant to come back johann will never come back he is gone for good and dina with him never come back and dina with him yes to be his wife that is how these two strike your virtuous community in the face just as i did once but never mind that gone and she too in the indian girl no he would not trust so precious a freight to that rascally crew johann and dina are on the palm tree ah then it is all in vain bernick goes hurriedly to the door of his room opens it and calls in crop stop the indian girl she must not sail to-night crop from within the indian girl is already standing out to see mr burnick burnick shutting the door and speaking faintly too late and all to no purpose what do you mean nothing nothing leave me alone hmm. look here karsten johann was good enough to say that he entrusted to me the good name and reputation that he once lent to you and also the good name that you stole from him while he was away johann will hold his tongue and i can act just as i please in the matter see i have two letters in my hand you have got them and you mean now this very evening perhaps when the procession comes i did not come back here to betray you but to stir your conscience so that you should speak of your own free will i did not succeed in doing that so you must remain as you are with your life founded upon a lie look i am tearing your two letters in pieces take the wretched things there you are now there is no evidence against you karsten you are safe now be happy too if you can lona why did you not do that sooner now it is too late life no longer seems good to me i cannot live on after to-day what has happened do not ask me but i must live on nevertheless i will live for olaf's sake he shall make amends for everything expiate everything karsten hilmar comes hurriedly back i cannot find anyone they are all out even betty what is the matter with you i daren't tell you what is it you must tell me very well Olaf has run away on board the Indian girl. Burnick stumbling back. Olaf, on board the Indian girl? No, no. Yes, he is. Now I understand. I saw him jump out of the window. Burnick calls in through the door of his room in a despairing voice. Crop, stop the Indian girl at any cost. It is impossible, sir how can you suppose we must stop her olaf is on board what rummel coming out of bernick's room olaf run away impossible sonstad following him he will be sent back with the pilot mr bernick no no he has written to me hilmar shows the letter he says he means to hide among the cargo till they are in the open sea i shall never see him again what nonsense a good strong ship newly repaired vigeland who has followed the others out of bernick's room and in your own yard mr bernick i shall never see him again i tell you i have lost him lona and i see it now he never was really mine bernick listens what is that music the procession must be coming i cannot take any part in it i will not what are you thinking of that is impossible impossible mr bernick think what you have at stake what does it all matter to me now what have i to work for now can you ask 
you have us and the community quite true and surely mr burnick you have not forgotten that we martha comes in through the farther door to the left music is heard in the distance down the street the procession is just coming but betty is not in the house i don't understand where she not in the house there you see lona no support to me either in gladness or in sorrow draw back the curtains come and help me mr crop and you mr sandstead it is a thousand pities that the family should not be united just now it is quite contrary to the program they draw back all the curtains the whole street is seen to be illuminated opposite the house is a large transparency bearing the words long live karsten burnick pillar of our society burnick shrinking back take that all away i don't want to see it put it out put it out excuse me mr burnick but are you not well what is the matter with him lona hush whispers to her take away those mocking words i tell you can't you see that all these lights are grinning at us well really i must confess oh how could you understand but i i it is all like candles in a dead room well let me tell you that you are taking the thing a great deal too seriously the boy will enjoy a trip across the atlantic and then you will have him back only put your trust in the almighty mr burnick and in the vessel burnick it is not likely to sink i know now if it were one of those floating coffins that one hears are sent out by men in the bigger countries i am sure my hair must be turning gray mrs burnick comes in from the garden with a shawl thrown over her head carsten carsten do you know yes i know but you you who see nothing that is going on you who have no mother's eyes for your son listen to me do why did you not look after him now i have lost him give him back to me if you can i can i have got him you have got him ah ah yes i thought so you have got him back carsten yes make him your own now you have got him is that true where is he i shall not tell you till you have forgiven him forgiven but how did you know do you not think a mother sees i was in mortal fear of your getting to know anything about it some words he let fall yesterday and then his room was empty and his knapsack and clothes missing yes yes i ran and got hold of alna and we went out in his boat the american ship was on the point of sailing thank god we were in time got on board searched the hold found him oh carsten you must not punish him betty nor alna either alna what do you know about him is the indian girl under sail again no that is just it speak speak alna was just as agitated as i was the search took us some time it had grown dark and the pilot made objections and so alna took upon himself in your name well to stop the ship sailing till tomorrow <clears throat> oh how glad i am you are not angry i cannot tell you how glad i am betty you really take things far too seriously oh yes as soon as it is a question of a little struggle with the elements Ugh. crop going to the window the procession is just coming through your garden gate mr burnick yes they can come now the whole garden is full of people the whole street is crammed the whole town is afoot burnick it really is a moment that makes one proud let us take it in a humble spirit mr rummel all the banners are out what a procession here comes the committee with mr roland at their head yes let them come in but burnick in your present agitated frame of mind well what i am quite willing to speak instead of you if you like no thank you i will speak for myself to-night but are you sure you know what to say yes make your mind easy rummel i know now what to say the music grows louder the veranda door is opened rorland comes in at the head of the committee escorted by a couple of hired waiters who carry a covered basket they are followed by townspeople of all classes as many as can get into the room an apparently endless crowd of people waving banners and flags are visible in the garden and street mr burnick i see from the surprise depicted upon your face 
that it is as unexpected guests that we are intruding upon your happy family circle and your peaceful fireside where we find you surrounded by honored and energetic fellow citizens and friends but it is our hearts that have bidden us come to offer you our homage not for the first time it is true but for the first time on such a comprehensive scale we have on many occasions given you our thanks for the broad moral foundation upon which you have so to speak reared the edifice of our community on this occasion we offer our homage especially to the clear-sighted indefatigable unselfish nay self-sacrificing citizen who has taken the initiative in an undertaking which we are assured on all sides will give a powerful impetus to the temporal prosperity and welfare of our community Bravo! 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 you sir have for many years been a shining example in our midst this is not the place for me to speak of your family life which has been a model to all of us still less to enlarge upon your unblemished personal character such topics belong to the stillness of a man's own chamber not to a festival occasion such as this i am here to speak of your public life as a citizen as it lies open to all men's eyes well-equipped vessels sail away from your shipyard and carry our flag far and wide over the sea a numerous and happy band of workmen look up to you as to a father by calling new branches of industry into existence you have laid the foundations for the welfare of hundreds of families in a word you are in the fullest sense of the term the mainstay of our community and sir it is just that disinterestedness which colors all your conduct that is so beneficial to our community more so than words can express and especially at the present moment you are now on the point of procuring for us what i have no hesitation in calling bluntly by its prosaic name a railway Bravo! 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 but it would seem as though the undertaking were beset by certain difficulties the outcome of narrow and selfish considerations yeah, 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 yeah. for the fact has come to light that certain individuals who do not belong to our community have stolen a march upon the hard-working citizens of this place and have laid hands on certain sources of profit which by rights should have fallen to the share of our town That's right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 this regrettable fact has naturally come to your knowledge also mr burnick but it has not had the slightest effect in deterring you from proceeding no. steadily with your oh. project no. well no. known that a patriotic no. man should not solely take local interests into consideration yes. 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 yes it is to such a man to the patriot citizen whose character we all should emulate that we bring our homage this evening may your undertaking grow to be a real and lasting source of good fortune to this community it is true enough that a railway may be the means of our exposing ourselves to the incursion of pernicious influences from without but it gives us also the means of quickly expelling them from within or even we at the present time cannot boast of being entirely free from the danger of such outside influences but as we have on this very evening if rumor is to be believed fortunately got rid of certain elements of that nature sooner than was to be expected order. 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 i regard the occurrence as a happy omen for our undertaking my alluding to such a thing at such a moment only emphasizes the fact that the house in which we are now standing is one where the claims of morality are esteemed even above ties of family yeah. 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 Oh. allow me i have only a few more words to say mr burnick what you have done for your native place we all know has not been done with any underlying idea of its bringing tangible profit to yourself but nevertheless you must not refuse to accept a slight token of grateful appreciation at the hands of your fellow citizens least of all at this important moment when according to the assurances of practical men we are standing on the threshold of a new era Bravo! 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 Yeah! 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 Rorland signs to the servants who bring forward the basket during the following speech members of the committee take out and present the various objects mentioned and so mr burnick we have the pleasure of presenting you with this silver coffee service let it grace your board when in the future as so often in the past we have the happiness of being assembled under your hospitable roof you too gentlemen who have so generously seconded the leader of our community 
we ask you to accept a small souvenir. This silver goblet is for you, Mr. Rummel. Many a time have you, amidst the clink of glasses, defended the interests of your fellow citizens in well-chosen words. May you often find similar worthy opportunities to raise and empty this goblet in some patriotic toast. To you, Mr. Sandstead, I present this album containing photographs of your fellow citizens. Your well-known and conspicuous liberality has put you in the pleasant position of being able to number your friends amongst all classes of society. And to you, Mr. Vigeland, I have to offer this book of family devotions, printed on vellum and handsomely bound, to grace your study table. The mellowing influence of time has led you to take an earnest view of life. Your zeal in carrying out your daily duties has, for a long period of years, been purified and ennobled by thoughts of higher and holier things. Rorland turns to the crowd. And now, friends, three cheers for Mr. Burnick and his fellow workers. Three cheers for the pillars of our society. Burnick! Pillars of society! Hurrah! 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 I congratulate you, brother-in-law. An expectant hush follows. Fellow citizens, your spokesman said just now that tonight we are standing on the threshold of a new era. I hope that will prove to be the case. But before that can come to pass, we must lay fast hold of truth. Truth which till tonight has been altogether and in all circumstances a stranger to this community of ours. Astonishment among the audience. To that end, I must begin by deprecating the praises with which you, Mr. Rorland, according to custom on such occasions, have overwhelmed me. I do not deserve them, because, until today, my actions have by no means been disinterested. Even though I may not always have aimed at pecuniary profit, I at all events recognize now that a craving for power, influence, and position has been the moving spirit of most of my actions. What next? Standing before my fellow citizens, I do not reproach myself for that, because I still think I am entitled to a place in the front rank of our capable men of affairs. Yes! 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 yes. 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 But what I charge myself with is that I have so often been weak enough to resort to deceitfulness because I knew and feared the tendency of the community to espy unclean motives behind everything a prominent man here undertakes. And now I am coming to a point which will illustrate that. Uh -huh. There have been rumors of extensive purchases of property outside the town. These purchases have been made by me, by me alone, and by no one else. Murmurs are heard. What does he say? He? Burn it? The properties are, for the time being, in my hands. Naturally, I have confided in my fellow workers, Mr. Rummel, Mr. Vigeland, and Mr. Stanstead, and we are all agreed that— It is not true. Prove it. Prove it. We are not all agreed about anything. Well, really, I must say— That is quite true. We are not yet agreed upon the matter I was going to mention. But I confidently hope that these three gentlemen will agree with me when I announce to you that I have tonight come to the decision that these properties shall be exploited as a company, of which the shares shall be offered for public subscription. Any one that wishes can take shares. This is the basest treachery. So you have been fooling us. Well then, devil take good lord, what am I saying? Cheers are heard without. Silence, gentlemen. I have no right to this homage you offer me, because the decision I have just come to does not represent what was my first intention. My intention was to keep the whole thing for myself. And even now I am of the opinion that these properties would be worked to best advantage if they remained in one man's hands. But you are at liberty to choose. If you wish it, I am willing to administer them to the best of my abilities. Yes! 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 yes, 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 yes. But first of all, my fellow townsmen must know me thoroughly, 
and let each man seek to know himself thoroughly too and so let it really come to pass that to-night we begin a new era the old era with its affectation its hypocrisy and its emptiness its pretence of virtue and its miserable fear of public opinion shall be for us like a museum open for purposes of instruction and to that museum we will present shall we not gentlemen the coffee service and the goblet and the album and the family devotions printed on vellum and handsomely bound oh of course if you have taken everything else then by all means and now for the principal reckoning i have to make with the community mr rorland said that certain pernicious elements had left us this evening i can add what you do not yet know the man referred to did not go away alone with him to become his wife went dina dorf what what great commotion fled ran away with him impossible to become his wife mr rorland and i will add more betty be strong to bear what is coming this is what i have to say hats off to that man for he has nobly taken another's guilt upon his shoulders my friends i want to have done with falsehood it has very nearly poisoned every fibre of my being you shall know all fifteen years ago i was the guilty man Carsten, huh, johann now at last you have found yourself speechless consternation among the audience yes friends i was the guilty one and he went away the vile and lying rumors that were spread abroad afterwards it is beyond human power to refute now but i have no right to complain of that for fifteen years i have climbed up the ladder of success by the help of those rumors whether now they are to cast me down again or not each of you must decide in his own mind what a thunderbolt our leading citizen how sorry i am for you mrs vernick what a confession well i must say but come to no decision to-night i entreat every one to go home to collect his thoughts to look into his own heart when once more you can think calmly then it will be seen whether i have lost or won by speaking out good-bye i have still much very much to repent of but that concerns my own conscience only good-night take away all these signs of rejoicing we must all feel that they are out of place here that they certainly are in an undertone to mrs burnick run away so then she was completely unworthy of me louder to the committee yes gentlemen after this i think we had better disperse as quietly as possible how after this any one is to manage to hold the ideals banner high Ugh. meantime the news has been whispered from mouth to mouth the crowd gradually disperses from the garden rummel sonstadt and vigeland go out arguing eagerly but in a low voice hilmar slinks away to the right when silence is restored there only remain in the room burnick mrs burnick martha lona and crop betty can you forgive me mrs burnick looking at him with a smile do you know carsten that you have opened out for me the happiest prospect i have had for many a year how for many years i have felt that once you were mine and that i had lost you now i know that you never have been mine yet but i shall win you burnick folding her in his arms oh betty you have won me it was through lona that i first learned really to know you but now let olaf come to me yes you shall have him now mr crupp mrs burnick talks softly to crop in the background he goes out by the garden door during what follows the illuminations and lights in the houses are gradually extinguished thank you lona you have saved what was best in me and for me do you suppose i wanted to do anything else yes was that so or not i cannot quite make you out hmm. then it was not hatred not revenge why did you come back then old friendship does not rust lona when johann told me about the lie i swore to myself that the hero of my youth should stand free and true 
what a wretch i am and how little i have deserved it of you oh if we women always looked for what we deserve karsten one comes in with olaf from the garden bernick going to meet them olaf father i promise i will never do it again never run away yes yes i promise you father and i promise you you shall never have reason to for the future you shall be allowed to grow up not as the heir to my life's work but as one who has his own life's work before him and shall i be allowed to be what i like when i grow up yes oh thank you then i won't be a pillar of society no why not no i think it must be so dull you shall be yourself olaf the rest may take care of itself and you Auna. i know mr bernick i am dismissed we remain together Auna, and forgive me what the ship has not sailed to-night nor will it sail to-morrow either i gave you too short grace it must be looked to more thoroughly it shall mr bernick and with the new machines by all means but thoroughly and conscientiously there are many among us who need thorough and conscientious repairs Auna. well good night good night sir and thank you thank you one goes out now they are all gone and we are alone my name is not shining in letters of fire any longer all the lights in the windows are out would you wish them lit again not for anything in the world where have i been you would be horrified if you knew i feel now as if i had come back to my right senses after being poisoned but i feel this that i can be young and healthy again oh come nearer come closer round me come betty come olaf my boy and you martha it seems to me as if i had never seen you all these years no i can believe that your community is a community of bachelor souls you do not see women that is quite true and for that very reason this is a bargain lona you must not leave betty and me no lona you must not no how could i have the heart to go away and leave you young people who were just setting up housekeeping am i not your foster mother you and i martha the two old aunts what are you looking at look how the sky is clearing and how light it is over the sea the palm tree is going to be lucky it carries its good luck on board and we we have a long earnest day of work ahead of us i most of all but let it come only keep close round me you true loyal women i have learned this too in these last few days it is you women that are the pillars of society you have learned a poor sort of wisdom then brother-in-law lona lays her hand firmly upon his shoulders no my friend the spirit of truth and the spirit of freedom they are the pillars of society end of act four end of pillars of society by henrik ibsen translated by r farquharson sharp 1920-1930